That's real. I'm Jessie, and we're going to tell you about some creepy stuff today. Yeah, we are. How you been? Um, eh, eh. Low-key dying, but it's fine? Low-key dying. Yeah. Um, so, on Christmas Eve, I started getting a little not feeling great, but I was yeah. like, oh, I'm fine, you know? Um, and then Christmas Eve, I got pretty sick and hit hard. Mm. Um, I'm starting to feel better. Uh, but I gotta go to the doctor today and do, you know, the straight up COVID and flu test and all that crap. My hours have been terrible. I yeah. haven't been at work for the past couple days. I'm hoping that by tomorrow night I'll be in a much better place. But until the tests come back, like, who cares? And don't even get me started on, like, the healthcare system right now. It's just a nightmare to try to navigate anything. Yeah, we might have had a little rant before we started recording about how terrible healthcare in America is. Before we started recording, because, yeah. okay, so, uh, as some of our listeners know, I'm kind of in a place without insurance right now because of a move that I did, and then, um, yeah. so my insurance starts on the 1st, because I was able to do Obamacare and get back into that, mm-hmm. but it doesn't start until the 1st, and so I'm in this weird window where, like, hey, I need to return to work at yeah. some point, so I need to get tested immediately, but at the same time... <laughs> You know, I don't have insurance, so finding places to go. And it was in this weird window where it was Christmas and then it was the weekend. And then, you know, you hit Monday when everybody's been calling for the last four days. So it's been just a nightmare. Yay. But it's good to talk to you. It's good to talk to you, too. You make my day brighter. Aw, you make my day better. Yeah, it's snowing here. It couldn't <gasps> freaking snow on Christmas, but now I it's like... I didn't know that it snowed in Germany. I'm so oh, uncultured. It's... In theory, it snows a lot in Germany. It really? hasn't really while we've been here. We had like one big snow in February, I want to say, that was like four inches overnight. Uh-huh. And we're at... Last time I was out of my little recording hovel, uh, it was at like two inches. So Ooh. we're getting we're getting some snow. Are you going to go lay in it or like... Probably not. Is that a weird question to ask? I asked that to someone else recently. They they told me that, you know, it was the first time they'd seen snow. Okay. Um, it wasn't until just a couple years ago because of where they live. And I said, oh, what's the first thing you did? Did you make mm. a snowball? Did you lay in it? So you haven't seen snow for a bit. I saw snow, like, in February, and I'm from Missouri. Snow does not hold much appeal for me. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's snow. Darnell's already moody that he has to drive in it tomorrow, so... I think that's the difference. It's pretty. There's pretty wonderment if you've never seen it, but if you're yep. from the Midwest like we are, you're mm. so used to having to scrape your car off and all the inconveniences that it brings that you're yeah. just over it. Yeah. And that's yeah. pretty much where I am. Like, so right outside my office window, there's a street lamp, and because it gets dark at, like, 4.30 here, because Germany is a winter wasteland, <laughs> I I kept having, like, some some space cadet brain where okay. I was like, "Oh, pretty, oh, pretty, oh, pretty," because as it, as it's falling, it's just catching the street lamp, <laughs> and so I'm like trying to like make notes about something, and I'm just like snow, and then like I have that every five seconds. I feel like the well, dog and least, up. <laughs> at least it's pretty. Yeah. Speaking it's, of it's dogs, pretty. you're probably gonna hear a lot of dog boof at some point today. Um, Christy's got her daughter's dog here, uh, Izzy and. All the dogs, when they're outside doing their thing, they they apparently like to talk to the neighborhood. So, and that's right outside my window. I know it's par for the course at this point. Yeah. I just believe that you're Dr. Doolittle at this point with as many animal sounds as we get. So, we just lean into it. We have the what? menagerie <laughs> do, supposedly. All right. But I know that you're first tonight. So, what did you bring for us? Well, I'm finally going to tell you guys about Heaven's Gate. I finished Hey-o. the three-part documentary series. I've been doing some research on this. Bear with me. I have been a little sick. Um, so at the end, it might get a little floopy, but <laughs> we're going to we're gonna see it through. So half the notes, um, well, up until, like, the suicide, were written when I'm clear-headed and everything's great. <laughs> and then okay. The cold medicine got to me, so okay. we're gonna do it a double check over. I just I didn't get a chance to verify that part because I have like You're all pages good. of notes. <laughs> that reminds me of like my first semester of college when I had my art history class, super hungover, and like one of my first hangovers ever. Uh-huh. And like my notes are such trash from that day because I was like falling asleep in class and I was just like, oh god, I wrote something like 
the Aztecs did farmer stuff. Like, I think that was literally, like, a verbatim quote. I mean, you're not wrong. The Aztecs did do farming and agriculture. But, like, that's not a helpful note, Rue. (laughs) (laughs) And they're, like, sloping down the page, even though it's, like, a college-lined textbook or a notebook. And it's just, like, the Aztecs did farmer stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Oh, Heaven's Gate is going to be really, really good until we get to the good part, and then you're going to need to pause for a moment so I can so assess out, like, okay, what's cold brain, what's not. Oh, yep. before I start, though, yes, maybe have a gym update? Okay. Maybe. Um, I did think okay. so. We we had a little uh, cocktail hour before we started recording, if you will. Yes. And I thought I saw some weird, like, dancing light action behind you. So what's going on? Okay, well, I'll just be honest. Uh, the cat knocked down the curtains a couple days ago. She's gotten tired of being locked in this room, and I think she's tried to jump from the window. That's close. Oh, and so oh, she knocked oh, the blinds okay. down, and they're barely rigged up there. So I've gotcha. got a weird lighting situation happening okay. at this exact moment. So okay. that's what you saw. So, in the words of Ghost Adventures, <laughs> debunked. Debunked. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, okay, people, all right. I'm just going to throw this out there. We yeah. know I've been six for, you know, a bit. Um, and this was at the kind of the peak of my sickness. So I'm not okay. discounting this as a fever dream and I'll, I'll okay. get there. All right. But I woke up in the middle of the night mm-hmm. and I turned to look at my TV to see if um, the Roman Empire is still playing off from Netflix. Because that okay. seems to be my go-to fall asleep show right now. Better than Law and Order SVU throwback oh, that to is- our... Wisdom Teeth episode. <laughs> oh, side note, Bridgerton. I, like, I destroyed that show. I downed it in, yeah. like, a day on cold medicine. It's Wisteria Lane meets Gossip Girl meets okay. Pride and Prejudice. So it's very... So delightful trash. It's the best of trash. Love it. It's salacious. It's raunchy. It's proper. It's, like... Every good, bad thing that women like in a show. Delightful. So, killed that in a couple days. Um, so I go and I look at my TV to see, mm-hmm. you know, if Roman Empire is still playing or if I need to turn it on. Because I like to yeah. sleep with sound. Yep. Um, it should be noted that my big fluffy cat little face has not left my side the entire time I've been sick. She doesn't do that. Except for right now because yeah. she's like, screw you, I need to take a nap. <laughs> so she's usually like right next to me we share the same pillow which is probably weird but i sleep on one end of the pillow and she puts her head on the other end of the pillow So oh, precious i know it's cute right so she was asleep next to me and she wasn't awake when this happened and i feel the need to note that because animals do pick up on certain things yeah i will also note on the fact that for the past couple days prior to that i had been up non-stop so mm-hmm. She is a cat. They do sleep 16 hours. If something actually happened, which I don't know. I, yeah, I just, yeah. I'm dismissing this a lot. So here's what happened. Go to look at my TV. Um, my room is very small. Um, mm. that, so it's not like I'm looking into this vast room where I don't know what I'm seeing. And um, standing in front of my dresser is basically the figure of what I believe was a man with its back turned. Mm-hmm. Wearing kind of a gray coat that looked older in style, but possibly okay. like a wool or patch. And remember, I, I am very sick when this is happening. Yeah. Um, so, but I can't see his head or his face because it looked like he was bent over my dresser looking at something. Which is, mm. the dresser, the TV's right above the dresser, mm. maybe three feet away from me. Like, if I had my hand yeah. out here, it's about three feet to my dresser. It's close, yeah. And I was like... Crap. I'm like, Jim's not allowed in my room is the first thing that came into my mind. And I'm like, Jim and I have, we've talked about this. We have an agreement. He respects my space. I respect his space. All's usually pretty pretty cool. So I just was like, Jim, you're not allowed in my room. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, Although it it does feel very Jim-like in a grandfatherly sort of way to be like, oh, she's like super sick. Let me go check on her. I could see that. But then why wouldn't you just like be looking at me he was bent over my dresser looking at something on the dresser which i need to go over there and really like assess what is on my dresser yeah um but okay here's the part where it could have been like either coming out of sleep when you have that rush and you're still dreaming but you're now awake or something like that 
Um, then I look over to my hanging jewelry display. So I have this, mm-hmm. because I'm in small space, I've always had this, uh, it's an over the door jewelry hanger and it yeah. displays all my jewelry. One, it keeps it out of the thieving paws of my cat. Who's really into shiny stuff. She's literally a cat burglar. Oh, she is. She steals my jewelry nonstop. She's into the shinies. So it keeps that away from her. But, so I look over at my jewelry display, and, like, the top of it turned into the head of a lion, and then everything disappeared. Okay, you were on drugs. I wasn't on drugs, but it might have been a fever dream. Like, I'm okay. not dismissing the fact that I was sick. The lion thing was weird. The lion And then I was weird. like, huh, okay, maybe that's not Jim. <laughs> but maybe it was, but maybe it's not. But yeah. maybe he's trying to tell me something, but why the lion head on the jewelry? Huh. Why looking at the dresser? Also, Jim and I just have this agreement, and it's like an understanding. Yeah. Like, he does not mess with my space. I don't disrespect his space. Right. It's, I've never seen Jim in my room. Mm. I've told the story about how he knocks on the door. Right. So, f- to see something in my room was weird. Yeah. Well, and I remember, too, when we had that weird, when we first started the show, when we had, like, the weird blackout that happened in your yeah recording like sometimes weird stuff just kind of pops off in your space it does and i mean the house there's definitely something here and it's jim Mm -hmm. and like i've said many times i don't think he's here all the time he kind of pops in and pops out he really cares about the house and is attached to the house so i don't know that me getting sick would really warrant anything unless i was endangering his house so probably a fever dream but yeah, probably. I wonder if like because Jim is able to come and go as he pleases, if that means there's like some kind of portal. I don't I would doubt it. I really very much okay. feel like he's tied to the I don't know though, because Christy's yeah. granddaughter saw the woman with she the saw red boots. She thought was you. Yes, yeah. That she thought was me at one point walking down the hall. Mm-hmm. Um it, just to be safe, I went ahead and said some prayers and did a little smudge. I'm like, ah, I yeah. don't know if this was a fever dream, but regardless, sage kills bacteria, so let's just do all that anyway. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe. That's that's an interesting theory, because you're right. She was very scared for a while, and she still brings that up, so I don't think it was a, just an imaginary thing. Yeah. And it's so weird that it looked like you. That's so doppelganger weird. Right. But it was wearing red boots. Or boots. Yeah. And, like, I mean, I have boots. She thought it was mm-hmm. me, but I guess all she really saw was the boots. Yeah. And, I, like, I, I never want to be the person who, like, discredits kids. Right. When this kind of stuff happens. But, like, maybe that was just the best language she had to describe what she saw. Like, Well, she's very vocal. She described it okay. kind of like the other mother from Coraline is how she kind of related Yeah, that. I remember you saying that. Um, That kind of outfit style and boots. Hmm. Um, but she thought it was me and I was not home. Yeah. And she still so brings bizarre. that up and is creeped out about it. She still, like, hmm. won't go into the bathroom when Aww. it's dark or won't go into Christy's room if it's dark. She asks one of us to go with her. Which she Poor hadn't baby. done before. Yeah. Which it, is like, interesting. It's changed her, yeah. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, I'm not excited. So we, because you've been sick and because it was Christmas, we are recording on Monday night. We are. Which is not something we usually do. And so I'm going to be up late editing this. And it's also one of Darnell's away nights. I'm sorry. And we, for some reason, are, have not really been in the Christmas spirit and watched mm-hmm. horror movies all weekend. Okay. And I already live in an ancient German house of that course. has got a tenant in the basement that is not <laughs> of this plane. Uh, <laughs> so I'm a little primed to freak out, and I think I'm just going to make it through this night with a lot of coffee, and it'll be fine. Well, I will be up and around and probably in a waiting room for a very long time. So if you need to reach out, there you go. You know how to get me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're one it, of the it only people long that night. get me. I'm kidding. <laughs> but you are. Are you? Yeah. I'm kidding, but am I? <laughs> I'm the only person you have a podcast with. I better get you. So I've been listening to a lot of our older episodes lately. I'm sorry. Um, 
I'll get to my story at some okay. point, I promise. Um, but in doing so, I realized, one, I talk really fast, and I don't mean to. I just get so excited when I'm talking to you. I love it. <laughs> and about, like, the stuff that interests me. Yeah. And I feel like I interrupt you a lot, but we're doing this via Zoom, and, like, a lot of times on the recording, we can't <laughs> the Zoom definitely sync exactly. definitely doesn't help. And I think, so, a little behind the scenes, we've changed how we record, yeah. which helps me to... In, in post, go and make sure that we're not as horribly overlapped. Because sometimes, A, we're talking over each other because we're excited and we're like best friends, but B, the internet lag overlapped our voices. So I'm excited about that to not have that be such a bad overlapping situation. Yeah, there is definitely a time when we overlapped a lot more just because we wouldn't be able to hear each other. Yep. Or And then I get excited too. I, I love talking about this stuff. And this is really the only time a week you and I get to sit down and, yeah. and connect. We don't get to have our pizza nights anymore. I you know. know. I'm going to start calling your your um interruptions, if you will, interjections. Interjections. Instead I like of interjection, it because, it's an interjection. Well, I just want our listeners out there to know I'm not trying to be rude or step all over Rue. And hearing it back, I'm like, wow, this girl just wants to talk about herself. But, <laughs> Um, no, we just get excited. And also, I don't know if you noticed this, but between the first couple episodes that we did, my voice changed because in the first couple episodes, I was using my actor voice. I did notice that a little bit. I was like, this is not how Jesse sounds, but okay, do your thing. Well, it's because I'm not very vocally trained. I don't yeah. do a lot of voiceover. That's not my specialty. There are a lot of yeah. actors that can, but I just have a lot of natural reverb on my voice mm-hmm. that doesn't really coexist with that so when I'm doing commercials or I'm doing acting I have almost like a customer service voice I put on yeah that I put on in the first couple episodes to stand sound clear and and come across you know um in the best way that people wouldn't be annoyed by the low reverb right. in my voice yeah I I have not the greatest voice either I sound like a potato with vocal fry most of the time <laughs> And, like, by the next couple episodes, I'm just like, I, screw it. I'm talking to my friend. I'm yeah. doing this for me. Like, exactly. I'm, drop the actor voice. If you want to hear me talk very clear and have this expressive motivation, then please go see my actor reel on IMDb or anywhere else. But if you want to hear me talk like I actually am, yeah. like, listen to Supposedly, and I'm going to throw some fucks in there once yep. in a while. Yep. No, I did. I, uh, I've shared our podcast a couple different places, and I'm on some podcasting groups on Facebook. And someone listened and was like, hey, I have some feedback for you if you're interested. And I was like, yeah, always. Like, any way that we can improve right. would be awesome. And he was like, sometimes you have, like, some some feedbacky stuff going on. And I was like, yeah, I've been working to, to kind of brainstorm ways that we can improve our audio quality, et cetera, et cetera. And... Or I was like, oh, yeah, and I know recording over Zoom doesn't do us any favors. And he was like, oh, you're not in the same room as your co-host? And I was like, bro, I'm not in the same, like, country. And he you're was not like, in the same country. And he was like, oh, I take it back. You guys sound dope. And I was like, thank you. <laughs> we, t- you know, we're doing the best we can yeah. for the fact that we're so far away right now. Yep. And, I mean, of course we want to be in the same room and yeah. record. That's just not where our lives are or where the country is. Well, and also, <laughs> like, I don't know that we would have this show if not for all of these circumstances. Because, That's like, true. I think it came from, A, missing each other in general, but then really right. when your life changed so drastically because of the pandemic. Like, we would already yeah. try and get together occasionally with me being over here. Right. But then it really was like, yo, the whole world just changed. So... It's because of these less than ideal circumstances that we even have this show. So I'll take the subpar audio quality for that. Absolutely. And just know, like, if you're listeners, we're always working to improve it. We know we still have a a ways to go. Uh, With any technology, you're going to struggle. But anyway, the more I go back and listen to our episodes, it makes, when I get lonely, I'm like, I I miss Rue, but Rue's asleep because we're on different time planes. So sometimes I listen to our episodes and pretend you're here while I... Like, clean my room and stuff. That makes me so happy. I have a lot of people who have reached out and said that they listen just to hear me. And I'm like, oh, wow, that is such a form of flattery. And I'm also cringing so hard. So to all my stateside people, I love you and I miss you a whole lot. And that goes for my mom, too, who was like, yeah, I listen. And I was like, oh, no. And I, like, sent her the Chrissy Teigen cringe gif. My 
curtains on my studio just moved, and that scared the Do you, do you have something going on there? Nope, I sure don't. I have nothing. Did I send you here. my weird? No, nope, you didn't send me a goddamn thing. Man? Nope. Okay. I am alone tonight. Nothing is happening. Oh, you know what's over there on the dresser, now that I'm thinking about it. Mm. Okay, I have a little planter where I keep all my pine cones and golf tees that my departed grandparents kind of leave me in weird places, which is, sound, I mean, that's... Do you think it was a grandparent? No, no, they don't, oh, okay. they did not have that, that type of style. It was okay. too dated for that, honestly. Gotcha. It, it felt, it didn't, my grandpa would be more like members only jacket. <laughs> Okay. Not okay. gray cloth, woolen, heavy. Yeah, like 1800s. It looked a little patched in areas, coat. Like, I don't know that the. It's weird that I saw it that specifically. Yeah. Um, but I also have, let's see, I've got uh, a couple candles over there. I've got my sage over there. I have some crystals that Christy's given me. So that is kind of like. If you had to pick a mythical space in my space, a metaphysical yeah, zone, that, yeah. That would kind of be it. Yeah. Also, I did just debunk what happened to me. My water bottle that's sitting on the floor fell over, oh, and it moved my curtains. Okay. Well, can we can we say it together? Debunked. debunked. All right. <laughs> All right. Tell me about Heaven's Gate. I am going okay. to tell you about Heaven's Gate. Twenty-one minutes in. All right. You can cut out whatever you want. Oh, okay. Probably none of it. Hi. Welcome to Happy Hour with Jesse and Rue. And we are gonna get a move on this. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> <laughs> so I gave the segment chapters. <laughs> okay. This is the first story that I've named chapters. Um, so this chapter I've called Tea and Dough Meat, Two Become One Who Call Themselves the Two. Okay. And surprisingly, I'm not on cold medicine at this point. <laughs> oh, God, I have no expectations then. I was like, oh, she's high, it's fine. Oh, no. And part of that was a reference to an old Spice Girls song that came on the radio recently. When you become one. Oh, and I have a sing along we're gonna do during this story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Throwback. Okay, okay. To become one. Yes. That who call themselves the two. Chapter one. Okay, so we're gonna start our story with Marshall Herf Applewhite. Um what a name. who I'm gonna refer to a lot through this as Doe. Or Herf or just that guy. Okay. So Marshall Herf Doe, or that guy, was mm-hmm. born the son of a Presbyterian minister and former soldier. He grew up in a very rigid background um, with very high religious expectations. So he starts kind of beginning his foray into biblical prophecy in the early 1970s when he's fired from the University of St. Thomas in Houston, Texas. Apparently, there was an alleged relationship with one of his male students. He was a choir director at the time, um, and he was he was very much a musical person, and a, and he kind of had loved theater. We're going to get into that a lot. Okay. Um, but his father, of course, being a Presbyterian minister at the time in the 1970s, mm-hmm. did not like the fact that he had a gay son, and he... I don't want to say he went as far as to disown him, but their relationship was definitely very shaky because of that. Yeah. And I feel like this is important to mention strictly because it kind of influences some of the theology as time goes on. And it puts you in a good perspective of where this man was coming from in a place where he was told he could not be himself, but he's grown up in this very religious, strict background. Was he out? Well... I mean, he wasn't at the time because he was married, and his wife divorced him after this allegation. Oh, okay. So I'm going to go with no. Okay, so there are different versions of what happens next, right? A version that circulated around his former school of employment was that he decides to go to perform opera. And he's going to play the character Olin Blitz from Susanna, right? And okay. basically the character is a preacher who misleads a bunch of people and gains this following. So he's in rehearsal when he has the psychiatric issue and is hospitalized. Of course, Herf, Applewhite, that guy, Doe, yeah. recounts this entirely differently later on VHS tapes that are discovered with his teachings. So, And it was a vision, not a psychiatric no no no. Episode. it was a psychiatric episode and this is what's no but i mean is he claiming it it was a vision i'll get there his version is that he goes to a hospital where he's visiting a sick friend and he meets this nurse right once again rumored it's a psychiatric hospital but it's here nor there 
So he meets a nurse by the name of Nettles, who was substituting for another nurse who at the time was working with premature babies in the nursery. How they necessarily encounter each other is really up to debate. But yeah. Apple White later recalls that he felt as though he's known this nurse Nettles for a long time, and he concludes they had met in a past life. In fact, she tells him that their meeting had been foretold by her, to her by extraterrestrials, and she's very into astrology and kind of some different ways of thinking. It is the 1970s. We're dealing right. with psychedelic drug culture and yep. um, a bunch of things at this time. So Bonnie Nettles, being much into... Uh, theology and biblical Mm -hmm. prophecy herself says you know what hey i feel a really close connection to you i'm really into astrology do you mind if i do your chart okay so he's very much into this himself and he goes yeah okay sure and she does this chart and basically what she tells him is you and i are destined to work together in some form and this story kind of evolves over time so she says they're destined to be together on some level and to do this grand thing Chapter 2, The Awakening Period. Ooh. So Applewhite and Nettles ponder the life of St. Francis of the Assisi, and they read works by all these different authors, including um, Helena Bavaski, R.D. Lang, Richard Bach. They study the King James Bible and in several passages in the New Testament, and they begin focusing on the teachings of Christianity, anti-Semitism. Oh, no. Oh. Okay. Ascenticism. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm, okay. That's look, better. Guys, I like that I one more. <laughs> um, Applewhite was also a huge fan of science fiction, including works by Robert A. Helladin and Arthur C. Clarke. So by June 19th, Applewhite and Nettles' beliefs kind of do this wibbly wobbly thing where they solidify into a basic outline for their new theology. In this, they kind of conclude that they've been chosen to fulfill biblical prophecies and that they have been given a higher level minds than other people. They write a pamphlet that describes Jesus' reincarnation as a Texan. It's very thinly, thinly veiled to be that dude, Applewhite. Uh, Where else would Jesus come back to? Yeah. That's so, like, (laughs) Book of Mormon. (laughs) It does seem a little (laughs) on the nose, you know what I mean? Yeah. Everything's bigger in Texas. So they conclude that they are the two witnesses that they are described in the Book of Revelations. A lot of people that study them around this time period or afterwards mm-hmm. in, in hindsight kind of think that they just went off somewhere and dropped a bunch of acid and kind of solidified these findings after after weeks of kind of disappearing and, and being together. Um, uh, whether they did that or not, I'll leave that up to you. So at the time, Nettles is very much interested in UFOology, and it's noted that at one point, her and her daughter see this light in the sky, and they they concoct this story about how grand it would be to leave the planet and go on a UFO to all these different planets and just leave the world behind. I mean, in 2020, that's not the worst idea. Well, I know this turns into not a good idea. This turns into not into... But that one sentence alone, I I understand (laughs) the thought process. I don't like how it's going to evolve. But if we full stop there, yeah. I'm team leave the planet in 2020. (laughs) Oh, no. Oh, this ends so badly. (laughs) I'm vaguely familiar with this story, and yeah, I I know. know. I know you are. Yeah. But but the still. reason I mention the her and her daughter antidote is interesting because this it really does become later what this religious group or I'm just gonna call it a yeah, cult. It's, it's a, a cult. cult. Let's call a cult a cult. Um, what they kind of become to believe in this vastly this experience she experienced with their daughter comes on to kind of form more of their theology yeah. or ideology. Right. I don't know if I even want to call it theology at this point because I don't know. I guess to them it was. Yeah. I get, yeah. So, I'm going to keep... That's another thing I noticed. I always say so, and I'm trying not to say you, so. It's just because I get excited about the next you part. You have a, a, a complex with how much you say so, because I don't think it's that often. I think you're all right. Yeah. But I went through media training, and I got that slapped out of yeah. me very, very young in my life. So, to revert to it... Oh, I said so again. Anyway. You must only... you Clamp your hands like you're uh, Julie Andrews, and you must do this whole thing, like, very prim and proper... 
It's so funny that you mentioned Julie Andrews because I have a whole chapter about oh, her. Oh, what? Okay, that part I'm not familiar yeah. with. Keep going because oh, she's oh, like get my queen of Genovia forever. Oh my god. I love me some Julie yeah. Andrews. If there's one person on the world I could pick to like have some drinks with and get like get a little sauced and have a really good conversation with, Julie Andrews, man. God, she's gotta be fun. Saucy. Oh, she would be so fun. My dream is like yep. her, Betty White, and the Queen if the Queen let loose a little bit, you know? Mm-hmm. Okay. Maybe I Helen just... Mirren. Helen Mirren would be fun. Dame Helen Mirren. Yeah, Meryl yeah. Streep should be somewhere in there too. I could see that. I just, I just badass just bitches is what love that is. old ladies like they're I, I'm so intimidated by them all because they have so much wisdom and they're so freaking classy but oh my god to, to have drinks I don't know that it would take me a lot of drinks to be able to actually like not sit up completely straight and like have a conversation with Julie Andrews because I would just feel like Mia Thermopolis the whole time let's let's change it though you know okay. let's not call them old ladies because someday we're gonna be in that category and we're not gonna want to be called that what should we choose instead oh so See, old lady for me is like the highest form of esteem. I think I have a weird, I have a weird complex because my my mom died so young that I'm like, oh, oldness is to be revered. But Aww. yes, uh, I'm a fan of like the the witchy crone. Okay, That's well, always... don't call them a crone. That's even worse than calling them old ladies. Well, no, because like. In certain, like, spiritual practices, that's, like, a, a high elder. Like, okay. you, you reach that level by how much wisdom and knowledge. It's know. like the village elder. It's like the female equivalent. I would be what do you offended want to, be? to be called a crone. I would like to be a woman of advanced level. And I'm saying that because it also kind of ties back into the story. Because they're very much about leveling up. I don't know. I okay. feel like as we get older, we gain more wisdom. We gain more insight. They're just on a higher level than us. I want to be called a bitty. I love that. It's so sassy and it's it's kind of mean, but I want to be like a, a reclaiming the word bitty. I, like, re- I will call you bit a bitty when you get old. Yeah, as I want to be an old want. bitty. Yep. I'm so stoked to get old. I can't wait to get so old that people just laugh off what I say. <laughs> That's the dream, isn't it? <laughs> right? Trust, trust me, they're doing that now, Rue. We all... <laughs> <laughs> They're doing right. that now when they listen to the podcast to both of us. No, but like, I mean, like some serious shit. Like, you ever see like those Reddit posts of like, my grandma said she killed her first husband at the dinner table tonight, and we were just like, oh, grandma. <laughs> Like, I'm not that old yet. I can't say I killed someone. I mean, I haven't killed anybody. But should I ever have to kill someone? I'm not old enough to reveal that over mashed potatoes. I appreciate that you're planning for your future murder confession at a family dinner. That shows some real thought about your, you know, 40-year plan. You know, I'm always thinking ahead, making vision boards. It's just who I am. Basically, they say Jesus is a reincarnation of a Texan, thinly yep. veiled to be apple white, Joe, right. that guy. Yep. Furthermore, they conclude that they are the two witnesses described in the book of Revelation and occasionally visited churches or other spiritual groups to speak about their identities. This is the time they start referring to themselves as the two or the UFO two. To become one. Who call themselves two. And they believe that they would be killed and then restored to life and in view of others transported into a spaceship. This event, which they often referred to as the demonstration, was to kind of prove their claims and to dismay the ideas that were poorly being received by the religious communities that they were putting out there. I will note that in making this note and watching and reviewing all this information I've been taking in about this over the last one, how long have I been doing this one now? Three weeks? A couple weeks, yeah. Right. There is some differentiating information out there as to whether they're being killed and then restored to life. At this point, it's basically a metaphor. I'm just going to throw that out there. Um, I know it talks about that in these notes, um, but at this time, it is strictly more of a rebirth aspect than a a killing aspect. And I'll I'll show you where it makes that differentiating, where it kind of takes a hard left turn there. Yeah. Um, all right, get ready for uh, some slightly cold medicine-induced notes, because Woo. I have here that there was an open living room filled with plastic lawn chairs, which goes way later in my story. But okay, you note that and remind me when I talk to you about the mansion, just throw that out there again. <laughs> all right, sounds good. It sounds kind of like maybe you were just, like, making a Sims 
floor plan in your mind. You're like, oh, write that down. That's good. No, during the drugs. documentary, they showed footage, <laughs> and occasionally something would catch me as, that's really weird, and i just throw it in there and be like, okay. when I get to that point, I'll refer to this later. But okay. when it comes up, I don't know. I feel the need to say it. All right. They claim that if you follow their teachings, your body would metamorphosize much like a butterfly, and it would turn you into space alien, and eventually you would go aboard a spacecraft and begin a new life. So it is a metamorphosis, a rebirth that's physical, but it isn't much focused on the dying in the sense that a caterpillar forms a cocoon and then is changed. Okay. They start recruiting. Chapter three, recruitment. Uh, okay. Now, how would you go about recruiting a cult? I mean, like a like an MLM. I would do it. However, all those multi level <laughs> marketing businesses are so damn successful. Oh, you would go straight up pyramid of power. I would because it's just proven time and time again to be effective. Right. I would be like, "Hey, girl, I own my own business. <laughs> Come to this meeting." And then, "Hey, girl, you're in a cult." <laughs> you're not wrong. <laughs> Since the 70s, there's not internet, that's not a thing that's happening. They posted a lot of flyers around different towns that they'd visit, basically outlining these flyers. I tried to find one of them to read because they were so out there. Uh, I really want to hang, I want to frame one and hang it on my wall. I'll keep looking. They show one in the documentary and I was trying to like type it as fast as I could, but they really scrolled down it kind of fast and I was like, Uh. ah! Damn it. I'll, like, buy one on Etsy, because that would be tight to hang up in my studio. Here's the gist of it. Okay. They talk about how they are the two um, sent to Earth to kind of take people to a next level, a higher plane of existence. Heaven, if you will, but heaven that cannot be achieved by dying, right? Um, sure. And then it, it rambles on a bit, where they talk about UFOs, and then they ramble on about how, oh, this is not a UFO group. But if you're interested, it is led by two aliens, right? <laughs> Okay. That, this is a much abbreviated. <laughs> okay. If you if this is not a UFO group, but sidebar, we are aliens. How do you not lead with that? They really did put that in there. They're they're like oh, this is not a discussion so of UFO topics, but we are aliens, and we're going to talk to you about how you can leave the planet on a UFO. By the way, um, it was actually quite elegantly put with the weird ad edition about that. Just kind of thrown in there. Asterisk. We are aliens, just so you know. (laughs) This is a comedy podcast. (laughs) Um, And this is a very long story. I'm going to take, I'm going to take some liberties with cutting things where maybe they don't. (laughs) That's all you need to know. Uh, But look up the poster. It's, it is interesting if you can find it online. If not, Heaven's Gate on HBO, The Cult of Cults, amazing documentary. They show you about it. They have great interviews with former members, including a guy that just like, he's an old pothead. And I just kind of love him because he's like so (laughs) stereotypical X seventies yeah. guy who joined a cult that you couldn't even make it out. Oh, that's fabulous! I want him to be my grandpa. He's he's kind of awesome, and also <laughs> uh, you worry about him a little. Well, yeah, probably like you would. Yeah, um, a little bit. They start holding these meetings right in public spaces, mm-hmm. and they start gaining a little bit of press. Eventually, they resolve to contact the extraterrestrials. And they're seeking these like-minded followers that they want to refer to as the crew, because you need a crew if you're going to be, like, you know, leaving well, sure. the world in a UFO. You're going to need somebody to to pilot that bitch. So. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> this? Yes! Yes, that's one of them. Okay, okay they're all different. they are different posters. Okay. It's not like they just made the same flyer and posted it everywhere. It gets adapted, different groups, different times. Which I assume you'd have to do, because you'd have to put a new location down at the bottom of it anyway. But that is yeah. one of them. I don't know if that's the exact one that I read, but it was in a pile okay. that I saw in the documentary. Are you going to read well, it? Well, I'll... Oh, sure. It's very long, but I'll, yeah, I'll read some highlights. that's why I just, I, like, briefed it. Well, I we can put it on our it Facebook. Long and I couldn't yeah. Pick it up. No, I just wanted to see if I could find one because I'm like super interested in. Yeah. I mean, they're out there, and there's a lot of different ones, or at least three that I saw. I'm just gonna put that in the category of a lot of different ones. If you don't want out of the human kingdom, you don't want into the kingdom level above human. I'm assuming. Wait, what town is that from? I'm assuming that's a later one. Sacramento. That's... 
Yeah, that's a little more okay. evolved than how they start out. They start out a little more, a little less on the extreme are, scale. Are the, is this one of the older yes, ones? Yes, yes, that's okay. one of the old ones. So read that one. UFOs, why they are here, who they have come for, when they will leave. But it's not, not a meeting a, about UFOs. <laughs> not underlined a discussion of UFO sightings or phenomena. There it Down is. Down arrow. Two individuals say they were sent from the level above human and will return to that level in a spaceship, quote, UFO. Within the next few months, this man and woman will discuss how the transition from the human level to the next level is accomplished and when this may be done. This is not a religious or philosophical organization recruiting membership. But Uh, it uh, was. Okay. It it was. However, the information has already prompted a number of individuals to devote their total energy to the transitional process. You see how contradictory that is? Like, they're like, oh, UFOs, but not UFOs. Oh, but religious stuff, but not religious stuff, but religious stuff. It sounds like such a, like, cool kids. Like, oh, you wouldn't even know about this. But I know Which, like, makes you want to get into it more. You're like, no, 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 please, let me in your cult. And they're like, it's not a cult. And you're like, I want to be a part of this not cult cult. Uh, okay, hold on, hold on. Uh, if you've ever entertained the idea that there might be a real physical, physical is for some reason in all caps when all the rest of this is just handwritten in regular typecase. Yeah, they're very big on the physical aspect of it as yeah. being an obtainable real thing. They really they also, focus on that physical. They also spelled beyond with a U as in beyond <laughs> the Earth's confines. You'll want to attend this meeting and it's in... The Bayshore Inn in Waldport, Oregon. Which yielded 20 members from that particular meeting, by the way. What? Yeah. But they weren't asking yeah. for members. But they were People just wanted to <laughs> devote their total energy and all their physical junk. <laughs> Don't even act like if we were in the 70s and saw that flyer, we wouldn't roll up with some popcorn and be like, y'all are crazy, but we're here to watch this happen. <laughs> like, what Listen, is this? Listen, I would, yeah. We'd be there. We'd be at the meeting. We wouldn't join up, but we yeah. we'd we'd be like, okay, let's let's listen to what you think. This is interesting. I, I do worry though that with you and I, we would take the joke too far and accidentally get involved. Like, do you remember in like two thousand? What was it like sixteen, seventeen? When like nerd nerds were like dabbing. And then, like, we started to dab, like... I never... I'm ironically. Not, I never dabbed ironically. And then, I like, it became a part of culture. Like, I worry that we would get into something like that. Or, or like, where you say a dumb word that's, like, popular, and then <laughs> you say it ironically so much that it becomes a part of your vocabulary. I worry that you and I would be like, let's go troll these meetings, and then <laughs> accidentally join a cult. And then flash forward to what comes next, and we're in the woods with a bunch of camping gear just to see how things go. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's a very us move. <laughs> All right, I'm clicking away from the Zoom screen for a second okay. to resume my notes. So just yell at me if the you know a guy in a great okay. coat material. I just had to see this, so yeah. Okay. Yes, that is the poster I was referring to in this. Okay. Okay. So where am I at this point? They're having these events. They're posting these posters around town. Twenty yeah. people join up at that meeting and. There's a group that meeting that even had 80 people in attendance at a Studio City home where they share this simultaneous revelation that they were told that they were the two witnesses written into the Bible story of end times. So this is the first time they really reveal their theology, even though they had shaped it prior. And yeah, it's very adaptable. I'm sure when you're making stuff up, it often is, you know? Yeah. Um. So you... You get to see the evolution of this theology. In 1975, the crew decides to assemble at a hotel in Waldport, Oregon. Isn't that where we Ayo. just, yeah, read yep. thing from? At the Bay Shore Inn. Yep, they get 20 members there, including wow. my boy Sawyer, um, ex, ex-pothead, well, no, still very much a pothead that they interviewed. <laughs> he does show he's growing pot, so I'm not oh. without foundation. You're not saying, outing so. him? <laughs> He's like, hey, here's my pot. He's in Cali. It's legal. Okay. No judgments. He's joined a cult. He's been through some shit. Whatever I guess you need to do. He deserves it at this point, honestly. (laughs) You know what? Be an older guy. You can be a crone with some (laughs) 
<laughs> you do your bitty thing with your, your week. Dude. Yeah. I'm not going to judge. Basically, they get the 20 members to join, and this is where, you, if we found that poster and attend this meeting, this is where we accidentally take it too far, because... They say uh, you should sell all your worldly possessions, say farewell to your loved ones, and you should embark on this uh, this like journey of a lifetime with the group. Hold on, is this just a military marriage? Because that's basically what I did when I moved over <laughs> here to Germany. <laughs> <laughs> the group just up and vanishes from the hotel where they're having this meeting and from the public eye. And in fact, this is even covered that night on the CBS Evening News by Walter Cronkite, who reports that the group had disappeared in one of the first national reports on the developing religious groups at the time. Here's a quote. A score of persons. I, oh, let me do a Walter Cronkite here because they did. Right, like, it's like. That's so Abraham Lincoln. But in this so article I took this quote from, they really, they they wrote it like he would say it. So it's just a disservice to whoever yeah, Copy absolutely. this Let's not do the Cronkite book. Walter Cronkite. <laughs> a score of persons have disappeared. It is a mystery whether they have been taken on a so-called trip to eternity or simply been taken. In reality, Apple, White, and Nettles had arranged... Oh, no. Uh, quote's over. Okay. Oh. In reality, they kind of arranged for the group... You have to do the whole rest of the story as Walter. <laughs> this is Walter Cronkite. <laughs> good night and good luck. Is that his saying... It is now. Here. I think it was like good night and it might be good luck. He has a mustache. Good and luck. That's how so the cookie fr- crumbles. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Bruce Almighty. Good night and good luck. Yeah, because <laughs> Bruce Almighty was taking it from that. All right. I know, but you gave it such a Bruce Almighty vibe with your hairbrush. I was going mustache. for that. Thank you. Okay. It, it's not a hairbrush. It's a dry brush for your face oh. to exfoliate. Pardon me. And like okay. make the blood go to your face, but also it just feels nice when you're you're itchy somewhere. It's like on your All face. Right. It's it's nice. They disappear. Boo boo. But in reality, they tell a bunch of people to bring camping gear and and meet them in this wooded area away from everybody. And that's where Jesse leaves the cult. Really? She's like, oh, camping? Uh, I'm out. This was fun. This was fun when there were snacks. Oh. And you were inviting me to like a conference room in a hotel. And we were talking but about UFOs. Like, yeah. And now. I wasn't aware of the camping part. We're camping. Look, you're not wrong. <laughs> I know I'm not. I don't. I would camp again, I guess. <laughs> not in this capacity. We've talked about how, at this point, we're lost in the woods and we're taking our bras off because we're friends. That sounded yeah. wrong, but if you've caught our other episode, you know where we're going with this. Yeah, go back to, what is that? Episode 24? It's called No Bras in Nature, so find that episode and listen to that one if you want to be in on our inside joke. Basically, we would end up camping to make fun of them and then go in the woods, yeah. lose our bras, and be murdered somewhere. Yep. So they start evading detection by authorities. And the media enabled the groups to really focus on Toe and Dee's doctrine of helping members in the crew achieve a higher evolutionary level above human, which they claim to have already reached. The problem with this is the more the media is talking about these people are being claimed to be alien, what's happening? Uh, They're doing drugs? No, like, you're putting the message out there that these people, you're kind of sharing their doctrine to a sense that more people are hearing the message. Oh, okay. I and like my answer, too. They're, they're kind of having members stagger in over this time period. Gotcha. Participants at the... Ooh, here's some of my fun little notes here on cold medicine. Participants at the recruitment meetings really commented often about the intensity of Marshall Applewhite Doe or that guy's eyes. One member even went as far as to say he felt as though... Oh, this is Sawyer again, my, my pothead guy. Oh, he right felt on. as though he was sitting in front of Jesus and that... That there was, like, electricity coming out of his eyes, and there was just electricity in the air, and everybody felt it. Okay. That's the drugs. I, he was, he doesn't discount that he was on some stuff at that time. Yeah. <laughs> Participants at these meetings really, really focused in on this. A lot of them even said that they believed that he was Jesus incarnate, and they just felt it when they they're there. So they, they ditch all their stuff and they end up camping in Boulder County. Um, this group is often described as a Christian offshoot and scholars kind of refer to this as a militarian group. Okay. Millenarian group, I'm sorry. <clears throat> With the belief that the world is coming to an end. 
So groups like this tend to arise in times of great social stress. Let's look at what's going on in the 1970s. Oh, no. What's happening? I mean, everything. What? Everything got... is happening. Yeah. You know? um, I just like, I'm so scared that we're going to get another big cult now. <laughs> 70s um so we're talking about kind of nom. nom has ended at this point or is still going on what year is it 1970 then i think it's starting no I... because i took a class called the 1960s in vietnam in high school and i should oh. know more about this you really should i'm googling it now but you've <laughs> taken a whole class on it huh? i took a whole class and I, I got nothing here. Yeah, no. Oh, okay. Um, F- uh, 55 through 75. So Okay, so it was still going on. Yeah. But, like, the 60s, I guess, was the big chunk of it. So, yeah. 1960s Vietnam. Anyway, basically, that's still happening. We've got a lot of racial tensions yep. going on. Um, there's the hippie counterculture that's still very mm-hmm. much existing. Uh, women's lib is really going strong at this point as women continue to enter the workforce and fight for the rights. So, there's a lot of societal... Yeah. Marshall Applewhite liked to talk to, about himself in third person on videos. A what lot of a schmuck. <laughs> Once again, while watching the documentary, some of these things I'm throwing in there are just things I'm like, that's creepy. That's weird. There's yeah. a red flag. Listen. <laughs> this is one of those. If you are ever watching a YouTube video and you're like, hmm, this spiritual teacher sure has a lot of great ideas. But that person only speaks about themselves in the third person. <laughs> Run. Turn off your computer, go to the kitchen, get a snack, and never Glass think about that again. Because that is a cult. Speaking of cults, at this point, they decide instead of tea and dough, they're going to rename themselves Bo and Peep. Guess why? Because they have their sheep. Yes, that's a direct quote from them. <laughs> I hate this. <laughs> Oh, they changed their names back multiple times. Uh, yeah, I remember that there's a lot of lot of names. There's a lot of names. like yeah. a lot of name changes. I could tell you all the names they go by. I'm just gonna stick to uh, T and Do because of this awesome song we're gonna sing here. Great. Okay, uh, that sticks around for a little bit, and then eventually they're like, maybe we shouldn't call our our followers sheep, and maybe that's a bad idea. Let's go back to Doe and T, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. I bet you're wondering where does Doe and T come from. Oh. F- Fudge. Uh, Julie Andrews. Oh, uh, I was wondering how it was. Oh, I hate this. Yep, yep. You remember how he's a choir director and an opera singer, how he has a love of theater, how he bonds with nettles over this love with tea. They love musical theater. So they decided to change their names back to Doe and T, which God. originally had come from The Sound of Music. And in fact, in their Heaven's Gate teachings, they went as far as to remake the song. What's it called? Doe a Deer is what I call it. Yeah, probably. More the right. Solfa song, I guess. I don't know. I'm going to send you the lyrics and <laughs> we're going to badly sing this. Oh, too. I don't need the lyrics. No, 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 you do, because this is the Heaven's Gate version. No! I was like, yes! oh, oh, I have been training for this moment. Like, oh, I am a oh, thespian and through I and through. I right there with you, but no, no, no. This okay, is, while... This is Heaven's Gate version. While you send me the lyrics, because I just recently re-listened to The Sound of Music, because that's who I am as a person, we need to have a conversation about 16 going on 17. You're both that's children. Very problematic. Even if you're 17 going on 18, you're not prepared to take care of someone. Also, you're an actual Nazi. Get the hell away from my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I wish I had a keyboard here because I actually know how to play this song. Oh. Thank you, Tommy Coey, for teaching me this on the stage of our high school at lunchtime for like four <laughs> weeks because I could not learn it. And it's really simple. Love it. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. I Oh, God. Okay. All right. Hang on. I'm going to need to, like, clear my throat and stuff before we start this. <clears throat> me, 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 me. Me, me, me. I've badly sung on this podcast. I don't think I've attempted to sing well on this podcast ever, so. I never have either. Like, I've done vocal lessons. I was in a choir for a while. It's just, it's so much more fun to sing badly when you kind of can sing well. I will say it's not sung well in, in any of the video footage by the followers. <laughs> of course it's not. So we would really be on brand just to fuck this up a little bit. Beautiful. Are you ready? Yeah. 
Okay, you count us in or whatever you do. Uh, I wish I had a pitch pipe on me. Uh, all right, five, six, seven, eight. Doe is, is here, here to, to take, take us, us home. home. Ray, Ray, the, the focus, focus is, is on me. Me, me only. Next, next level, level mind. Five, next, next level, level will not, will not be. be. <laughs> this is great with our lag because we're just singing it around. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we go we accordingly, go accordingly to, to love. love. Level above oh, human, human. <laughs> to T, the, the one, one followed, followed by Doe, and, and that brings us back, back to, to the one that is, that our, is our older our member. member. Okay, you kind of messed that part up. <laughs> yeah, Tell they me. gave up at that point. Yeah, and, they're and just like, and the by the part. way, here we go. Do, me, me, so, so, re, fa, fa, la, ti, do. Wow. That was terrible. Um, so this is a formal apology on behalf of supposedly, <laughs> supposedly. Co. Uh, we're very sorry for this, and we understand that you're never going to listen to our podcast ever again. I don't feel good right now, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, and if, like, this is why I'm so amazed by all of the theater companies that are still producing creative stuff right now, because the the lag of trying to do something over the internet makes it impossible. Oh, it's so bad. It was so bad, yeah. Well, and also, like, they're not great lyricists in that not all of these have the right amount of syllables or follow the, like... In, they are in, in a cult, Rue. Well, I know, but he's still a choir teacher, so I expect more from him. But, like, in The Sound of Music, it's like, Doe, a deer, a female deer. And this is just, Doe is here to take us home. Like, <laughs> sir, do better. If if I had a keyboard here, I could play this, which is yeah. sad because it's like the only song I've ever learned how to play on the piano. You know, someday COVID will be over and we'll get to tour and have live shows and I will put it in our contract that there has to be a piano made available to you. And, and we can all sing this together, guys. We can all have a sing. That's how we'll end every show. Mark my words. We'll sing the cult song. I don't know about how I feel about <laughs> spreading their doctrination but you know Here. what could be fun you know what we'll, we'll manifest this right now 2021 goals we'll write our own do re mi cult song the cult of supposedly so coming your way po -ly. <laughs> aliens are in the sky Pirate treasure aquatic things <laughs> rue is teddy rickspin now <laughs> <laughs> So, sometimes no. Jim is here. No, no bras in nature there. And that brings us back to the pyramid of power. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. At this point, the, all the members are conforming to this look of what a crew looks like in a T and Doe's minds. So, they all have a very androgynous look. Okay. The women and the men's hair is cut very short. They wear very long button-up shirts or jackets that are collared and long pants that cover their legs. They are referring to their bodies as vehicles at this point, oh, which is kind of interesting because that's where we kind of put the little bit of a, the, the crowbar in that separates what is reality and what is mm -hmm. yeah. possibly going to lead us on to the next step here. Not the next level, the next step. Yes. They are very unsexualized and adapt an asexual lifestyle because it's thought in their theology that you have to kind of transcend that sexual mindset. And I'm going to kind of take a little diversion here because mm. I also think this really goes back to um, Doe's sexuality as being a gay man who wasn't ready to be out, who's outed. Right. Um, who's grown up in such a strict background that now he thinks the only way he can kind of ascend is to be cut ties with sexuality altogether. Yeah. And then you're looking at Bonnie Nettles, who at the time is, I want to say that she's even the leader. And a lot of other people go on to say that she's the leader and he is the follower. And you might have even noticed in our lyrics there, um, to T, the one followed by Doe. So yeah. he's not really calling the shots. You gotta remember, she's kind of prophesized that they have this great alignment. Right. But it's not a sexual alignment. They're not partners in the sense of a marital sense or mm -hmm. anything like that. So I really think that's an interesting part to focus on 
when they are taught to be so asexual and unsexualized and to cut ties with their urges and hormones and and sexual needs. Yeah, it it certainly makes me happier than how most cults are like, well, in order to gain your next step of membership, you have to have sex with the leader, i.e. I'm just a horn dog. You have to sleep with this this guy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. Yeah, because that's the that's the thing about most cults that I'm just like, I really hate this. Like it usually comes down to all the women bang the dude, right? Yeah. And and yeah. that's the thing is that like sure, there is tantric sex, there is all kinds of stuff, and intimacy can be shared with partners, and that's awesome. But another ruse tip corner, if you are joining a religious organization and sex is part of it. It's time to leave. This is not the right spot for you. Go get your snack and some water yes. and never come back. Yes. Okay. Uh, so they all have short hair, very asexual appearances. Right. And members' names are changed. Now, this is interesting. I don't know where they decided to go with this. But basically, your your cult, your Heaven's Gate, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. No, it's a cult. Yeah. Your Heaven's Gate cult name yep. would be a first couple letters of your name, um, with ODY added on to the end. And some people would even pick new names to add to their OD name. Mm-hmm. So basically you would be like, Rue Odi. I hate it. I it's But just... you also have such a short name, I can't really do much with that. Yeah. Rody? You might be Rody. Ooh, okay, that's like a good carny name. I feel like this is such a, like... Respody? Respody? You Rispody. could be Respody because sometimes they took even a, a last okay. initial. No, this just feels like... I'd be Jaboti. the last food you ate... <laughs> And the street you grew up on and your dog's name. Like, that feels... I'm so interested as to why they chose that. But part of me wonders if this goes back to his choir yeah. practices and and melody. Okay. Yeah. That's the only thing I can think you'd of. Be, Jibodi, you'd be Jessity, wouldn't name. you? I hate it. No, I'd be oh. Jabodi. It's the first two letters? Look... It can be a variant of letters. In trying to write these notes and going over the documentary, they tried to explain it in the documentary, but it is, like, basically a cult that this guy kind of is just changing things. So some people change their names. Some people use, like, a couple initials from their first name and then part of their last name. It's a cult. I don't know why I'm trying to make sense. It's really your own. Yeah. Right. At this point, just know that there's some letters involved in Odie at the end. But three letters and then Odie. You can pick whatever three letters okay. you want to know. Like Sawyer was Soyote. Great. All right. Um, Soyote. Yeah. Okay. Since I'm Jesse B on everything, I assume I'd Jibodi. be Jabodi. Because Jasodi sounds well, stupid. Okay. Well, not stupider yeah. than Jabodi. Okay. All anyway. right. All right. Anyways. So they add that onto the end of their name. And at one point, that guy, Doe, even preaches castration. Oh, no. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, this is a really serious topic, guys. I know that this has been made fun of on shows like as, as such as Saturday Night Live. Um, and I'm going to try to attempt to cover this with as much respect yeah. as possible as you can on a comedy podcast. Basically, they decide castration is the way to go, right? And there are two people that immediately jump up and say, I, I'm so ready to go to the next level. Take Whoa. my penis. Oh, okay. Uh, one of them being our good friend Sawyer, oh, no. by the way. Get that man a, a, a bong. I forgot what they were called first. That was like a, a weed machine. <laughs> the vase you smoke out of? You made fun of me for saying that not long ago. Well, I think In I tried to... Com- pirate party. I think I tried to combine blunt and bong because my brain was short-circuiting for this it's poor man. It's still bong, Rue. <laughs> no, it'd be like a blong. It'd be bongity. A bongity? Okay. That's its, that's its Heaven's Gate name. Okay. Anyway. No, that'd be Bong Odie. Bong Odie. <laughs> Bong Odie. John Bong Odie. <laughs> I think we found our cover band. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyways, very serious. Let's uh, scale it back. Oh, okay. Woof. So two two men jump up, including our boy Sawyer, and are so ready to go to the next level. They're like, dude, take my penis. Okay. Take my testicles. Let's do this. Let's All get right. on that UFO. Those are words I never thought I'd say. <laughs> Uh, I forget what the uh, the other man is called, not Sawyer. Uh, they might have mentioned his name in the documentary. Okay. As a sign of respect, I'm, I'm not going to talk about him beyond the fact that he attempted this. Okay. And he starts immediately bleeding out. 
Okay. Maybe it's not a bad, I mean, maybe, no, not a bad idea. It's a terrible idea. Yeah. <laughs> maybe it's a terrible idea to just decide to castrate yourself. Well, at a cult meeting. It's already with... not a great idea because those are organs that are necessary, but it's especially not a good idea to do it in like an apartment. Um, at this point I believe they're in a mansion. I'm I'm jumping around a little bit in my storytelling here for some reason. My point though is it's something that should be done in a medical facility, clean room environment with like Doctors. Now, they did have some former nurses there that were the ones that are said to have uh, attempted this procedure. Okay. And um, so he starts bleeding out, and they're yeah. like, "Oh, oh, oh, shit! That Whoops. was not a good idea." Um. So they rush him to the hospital. He's stitched up, and then they turn to Sawyer, and he's like, "No, I'm good." Good for him. And that's kind of where the castration process ended for them. Yeah. Well, we tried. Um, I don't know if the man kept any of his organs. Okay. I don't know why I feel the need to mention that, but I, you're wondering if it, he's okay. It's the he he survives. Mind. Okay. I'm he survives. He's we don't know if he's intact cer- or not. Certain. Yeah. Okay. okay. We're not gonna. Is, he's not a dog. I feel like when no. you talk about an intact male, isn't that more like a circumcision thing? I don't know. I don't listen. I don't have those accoutrements. So I'm not sure. You have sure. access to those accoutrements. Yeah, you but I, ask. I'm not sure what the verbiage. No, if I ask Darnell, he's just gonna be like, "Oh God, no!" and then run away from me. <laughs> he's like, well, "You're what? No, stop talking to Jesse." Everything's growing. They relocate a few times. Um, act- this Odie stuff. The members with short hair. I believe this takes place after they settle in this mansion, right? Okay. Yeah. They take up residence and a purchase uh, Rancho Santa Fe mansion. Something unexpected happens, and I think it's right before this, before they move into the mansion. But at this point, we're entering the cold medicine zone. Oh. Which is going to be this chapter. So, okay. mm, yeah, bear with me here. All right. Uh, what is the worst thing that could happen if you're in a team with someone and you've got your crew established and they're all following you and you guys are gods, basically? What is the worst thing that could happen? Other than, you know, you almost kill the guy by taking his job. Well, I was going to say, since my first answer, which would probably be castration, is off the table... <laughs> As a threshold we've already crossed, I yes, I would say someone like blowing your your uh, not your cover but uh, like uh, defaming you, saying that I you're mean, not all powerful. That's kind of you hit the nail on the head okay. to an extent. So Bonnie Nettles T finds out that she has liver cancer, mm-hmm. and she passes quite suddenly. Yeah. Now, when you're telling a whole group of people, you guys are aliens that have taken up these vehicles and these vessels to lead them to a different planet in a starship, and then all of a sudden, boom, one of your your key people is dead who's supposed to be put on this planet for the sole purpose of taking these people up. Yeah. You kind of got to scramble to rework your, your theology you've been putting in their brains, right? Dying isn't, isn't a great plan for a cult leader. No. It, it doesn't go well when you're no. selling this image. Um, Doe is scrambling. This is not part of his plan. Yeah. And up to this point, he preaches that T and him will lead the others to the next lover level um, mm. while their followers were living. Remember? Remember how I talked about yeah. how it's more of a metamorphosis at this point. Right. So he goes into a tailspin of grief um, and depression and possibly another psychiatric episode. Okay. He's now lost the one person that he feels most connected to in this world, who has loved him regardless of his sexuality, yep. um, who has really been his partner through this life. Um, yeah. Um, this is the point where it's a defining moment. This mm-hmm. thing can go two different ways. The cult can realize, uh, well, maybe this isn't how it's supposed to be, or he can revise his plan. Yeah. This is when it goes from kind of a weird theology about UFOs and being alive and moving on to this next level to, no, um, we're gonna start moving towards group suicide. Yeah. At this point, you're just scrambling. Right. And, you know, I'm sure grief has a lot to do with this, too. Yeah. And I mean, if you really look into this guy's psychology, I mean, and that's probably in part why I cover him more than I cover T. Because don't yeah. get me wrong, she is technically the leader in all of this, and I don't want you to forget that. 
Right. But up until this point, this group was not headed towards group su- suicide. That's not what they preached. They preached a metamorphosis. Mm-hmm. This is a huge defining moment. Yeah. He revises the group's doctrines and claims that T's vessel had given out before she could complete her mission. Unfortunately, oh, okay. this is something that can just happen. Okay. Um, and that she will be continuing on in their mission, but in a different capacity. Now let's flash forward to the mid-90s. Give me some Backstreet's back. Backstreet's back. All right. All right. So it's the mid-90s, and the group has now become reclusive. And they're identifying themselves using only the business name, The Higher Source. Oh. Family members have sent out uh, private detectives trying to locate them. They've just flat up advantaged. Not that Walter Cronkite didn't do his due diligence in reporting. But also, like, come on. They're meeting in the woods, dude. Figure it out. Right. And they start using a website, because now we're in the digital age, yep. to try to recruit more followers and also just get their message out there. In late 1996, the group decides that it's getting close to what they referred to as their departure mm-hmm. after they come to the conclusion that the government is hiding evidence of a UFO trailing the hale Bob comet. Okay. A lot of people speculate as to where they get this information from, but it's believed that they get it from reports on the popular radio show Coast to Coast. Uh, yeah. Which love that show Mm -hmm. so good but they adapt it to fit their doctrine from there um at the time there were reports coming in about the hale bop comet and a lot of people speculated that there was a ufo trailing it um Mm -hmm. people with different telescopes and ufo enthusiasts claimed that there was some sort of i don't want to say craft but some sort of like anomaly following this comet that they had seen yeah uh, it's later debunked by the Coast to Coast uh, host and associates um, that discovered that these claims of a UFO following the comet are false, and these people probably saw debris or something else. Okay. But they believe that the UFO following the comet contains who? T. Right. The one followed by Doe. Yeah. And that she's coming to get them. So they run into town, and what's the first thing they do? They buy a telescope to verify this theory, and they start recording anything they see in the sky. But unfortunately, they don't see a spaceship, and this doesn't really go with their plan of this spaceship has tea in it and it's following the comet. So they they take the telescope back and return it, and they're like, it's not working. Fun fun fact, they return the telescope. All right. Yeah, I'm all right. All right. In the time leading up to their mass suicide, they have a lot of activities that people don't really associate with people getting ready to take their lives. But Mm -hmm. as someone who has spent time with survivors of suicide attempts, as well as um, someone who's lost loved ones to suicide, I will tell you that up until that moment, a lot of times you don't know. Yeah, Um, absolutely. They will very much go on living their lives as Mm -hmm. often. They often had. Not all the time, but it's not an unknown thing for this to happen. Well, and there's also such a an ideal, ideological difference between being moved to those great acts because you are so depressed or lost or unhappy and thinking that you are ascending to a different plane. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, there's, there's one that's like, I'm going to go on a road trip. That You know, it's like, oh, I'm just heading out. That That's a very different mentality thought and mentality then right. i'm ready to be done that being said and many people who who are taking their lives or will will go up and act as though everything's okay i remember um my my friend was going up and making plans up until um very last moment and yeah it, it's devastating because you don't you don't know it but, is it they is. continue to have these celebrations. They host a Christmas party for themselves. A member who had left returns and is reunited with the group. All of wow. this is documented on video cameras um, and VHS tapes. And they even go as far as to not only build their website, but to put copies of their websites and their teachings on floppy disks. <laughs> That'll take you back. All right. And distribute them around the world to different people and former members, just in case the U.S. later decides to take down their website after their departure. Interesting. In these videos, they are often seen speaking of their plans for departure, um, and once again, they distribute the VHS tapes to former members. Now, 
in watching the documentary and some of this footage, these videos are a little eerie because they seem to really take on the mannerisms of their leader, Doe, at the time. Um, one woman comments who's uh, studied this case multiple times that it's very interesting because in the day prior to some of these videos being recorded, there's a recording of Doe speaking about tea. And when he gets to the part where he's talking about tea coming for them in the comment, he gets choked up. Hmm. And then immediately in all the video footage following, the second anyone would mention that moment, they would get choked up in the exact same spot. Oh, wow. So they're taking on the mannerisms of their leader. Um, this is a huge indication of brainwashing to take yeah. on emotional things. And this is where we get to chapter three. All right. Four? What chapter are we on? I think it's four. I feel like we already had three. We've talked about at this point they're living in this mansion. The mansion they called the monastery. I'm going to tell you a little bit about this house because this becomes important into what we're going to talk about next. Okay. It was a 9,200 square foot mansion. Wow. Uh, yeah. Located in Rancho Santa Fe, California. That's an expensive place. Even then, they paid $7,000 per month in cash for it. Jeez. And I'm really interested to know what insurance company they had because leading up to their departure, they purchased alien abduction insurance. Yo, whatever insurance company came up with that is brilliant. That is a legal (laughs) Ponzi scheme. Pyramid of power. Like, I mean, I know that you and I are both given to believing things and what have you. But I'm a... still not going to buy alien abduction insurance. Dude, you barely, I mean, have, I health barely insurance. have health insurance. <laughs> <laughs> My cat is more insured than I am. <laughs> You're like, I think the aliens might provide me better health care than the actual American health system. Well, if we've learned anything from the Benny... <laughs> right. <laughs> from the okay. and Betty Hill abductions, that, All right. you know... They, they, you know, it wasn't so bad. So they were insur- insured up to their ears, basically. Yeah, it covered up to 50 members and would pay out $1 million per person. Do you think that they were just like, hey, we need alien abduction insurance, and their insurance broker was just like, uh, okay. Like, saw well, the dollar signs coming and it's like, yeah, uh, us, let me write up that policy. Pay us $400 a month and we'll cover uh, the, the, the 50 members, I guess. Yeah, that sounds about right. Do you want to know what it covered? What? <laughs> I I really don't. I'm but sorry. yes, I'm sorry. I, I don't mean this. to laugh at this. I I. It's I just. Really it's wish absurd. I would have been more alert when covering this particular part of the story. Um, yeah. Because I have noted here that the policy covered impregnation, abduction, or death by aliens in any capacity. <sighs> okay. All right. Yep. For an asexual group, it is interesting that they wanted impregnation covered. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. All right. You know what? I Hang on. In this article, there's a little click to explore that more. I'm just going to click on it. I feel like I need more info. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need to to look into I just Yeah. I have some questions. We. I think we both do. Okay. Uh, alien abduction insurance. Here we go. I'm going to click on that. So it is covered under niche insurance. Uh, it's, yeah. It's uh, niche insurance is provided for by low, small, small, low demand areas. And although the policies that are usually required are easily available, such as automotive, uh, home, life, travel, and business and insurance, mm-hmm. other forms can covered can be difficult to obtain. Uh, this, oh, wow. Wow, mm. they're not the only ones to do alien abduction insurance. Really? <gasps> Oh my god, okay, sorry, this could be a whole thing in itself Yeah, I am so curious. So some other things covered, I, I at this point I'm just on the Wikipedia for this, by the way. Yeah. Um, drivers with convictions, homeowners who have previously made a large claim. Okay, so it's like, if you've had some stuff go wrong. Alright. Alright. Professionals, professions which are unusual, piano tuners um, are covered, as such are scaffolders. Temporary invent insurance uh so you know live music events that sort of thing okay body part insurance for people whose livelihood depends on the state of particular body parts such as actors legs or nose um hand actors often have this by the way right 
And then, of course, there is alien abduction insurance. And the first company to offer UFO abduction insurance was through the St. Lawrence Agency in Adamonte Springs, Florida. So this is not even in California where they are. This is spectacular. I'm so interested. And and then they mentioned Geico, which they note does not sell alien insurance policies. So so why are we talking about it, dude? Come on. Uh, Can I get that with my TRICARE? I want to call some insurance. Can we do, for April Fool's, can we just do an episode where we call different insurance companies, cold call them, and ask them about alien abduction insurance? Yeah, I'm going to go to my local TRICARE representative and be like, um, so what about the aliens, though? And then I'm going to get, like, in trouble. Yeah, I won't do that, but it'd be It also notes uh, in this article that several celebrities and porn stars have had their penises underwritten in amounts exceeding $1 million. Van Halen? Van (laughs) Halen insured his penis? You want to know who else has their penis insured? Um, Lenny Kravitz. Okay, Van Halen frontman David Lee Roth. Okay. Um... It's some pornographic actor by the name of Kieran Lee. Good for and, them. Uh, in case you're wondering where to get your penis insured, Lloyd's of London has right. also been known for insuring other body parts, including the vocal cords of Bruce Springsteen. Oh, and all right. And that is all I can find on alien abduction insurance. What a delightful detour this has been. I, you know, I was surprised by that in my notes at the time. I was just like, eh, probably some insurance member they knew just made this crap up. But after a little bit of a further side investigation, um, what? See, this is what <laughs> makes me so angry about wealthy people. Is that, that you can afford, afford... alien abduction insurance? Why I can't afford yes. health yes. insurance? I know, right? It just no, I can afford it. I just, well, as, okay. As a self-employed person, it's much harder to obtain insurance. And I will say, we've talked about my 11,000 jobs. Yeah. None of them cover health insurance because I am very much self-employed. I'm a gig worker and I make a good living at what I do. Not good. I make a living at what I do. Yeah. But, I mean, even that being said, the best outlet out there for me is, you know, government-issued insurance plans yep. just because of how high deductibles are for the self-employed. Right. Um, but they have very strict rules, as I have unfortunately found out. Yeah. And if you move, you have to change your address within a certain amount of time. They can pretty much kick you off for a bunch of different reasons. Um, wow. And there is only, I believe, one time a year you can sign up, if not for a death, marriage, birth, right. or a significant move. So yeah. that's, I'm in that nice little window right now of not. Yeah, there are just so many people who who <laughs> cannot afford it. And it's just like, but yeah, sure. David Lee Roth can but get yeah, his cool. penis insured. Insure your dick. Right. That's cool. Yeah, glad yeah, for you. Good for you. Yeah, anyways, okay. I, does that cover, by the way, like, you know, if you have to take Viagra, do you get a... a a discount if on it that. does i'm gonna but, riot like does that cover i mean meanwhile most of us can't get covered on birth control which is has many purposes that are not just birth control by yeah, the way. or or people with uteruses who can't get access to even a freaking polycystic ovarian syndrome diagnosis much less treatment but okay oh, sure and don't even get me started on, on get your boner insured oh. that's fine anyway okay we need to continue because okay. we're just getting mad mm, all right yeah um Okay, so we're on part two, and I'll jump back in my story, but yeah. uh, I just got back from the doctor's office, and while I was driving, I had a couple things to add. Uh, one, I listened to Backstreet's Back because, like, you know, I had to. And I thought if we ever have a live show, we should open it with that. I would love that. That would be fabulous. And we should make Drew be our tech person, because as someone who's worked with Drew on that level, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, second thing. Also, yeah. hold on. Have you seen Drew's... In sync bye 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 dance. I have participated in Drew's in sync bye 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 dance, and that's right. We did it at your birthday it's party. It's phenomenal. <laughs> yes, I forgot about that. No, his uh, he pulled that out one day, and I was just like, okay, forty year old white man, get it. <laughs> I was like, okay, father of two. <laughs> oh, oh, we got some Justin Timberlake moves. Where are you keeping those? <laughs> And it's the face. Oh my god, it's the face, right? It's like the lip bite. <laughs> He's yeah. focused. And I'm just like, who are you right now? Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> the Birkenstocks have come off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
No, uh, that's also, that's another story, though. Uh, I was thinking of yes. Oh, also, you're not dying. No, I'm not dying, and the doctor yeah. said it's probably not COVID. It's just a stomach bug. Thank. And God. you had a really nice doctor. Experience. And I had like so the best doctor experience. I did maybe throw up a little bit on a nurse, and I feel really bad. But it turns out it's just it goes back to these stomach issues I've been having with not having good stomach lining at the moment. So. And as an We're aside, okay. thank you so much to all of our frontline essential healthcare workers. You guys are divine entities, and we love you so much. And I hate to follow that up with my next thought, but you know what? Screw it. I'm going to go there. I've been thinking about okay. I thought a lot about the penis thing on the drive. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was a segue. Look, I didn't mean to. It's just, it really stuck with me, and here's why. Um, I think we were both pretty angry about that for multiple reasons, but... What really got me is the fact that the lead singer of Van Halen has his penis insured. He, that's not even his livelihood. His livelihood is singing. Um, I beg to differ. Have you heard any Van Halen song ever? Well, yeah, but you know what I mean. Like, I, as an actor, I get, like, if something happens to my face, I'm not yeah. making the income that I would make. I get right. that. I can even see where certain sex workers, like the porn stars that had yeah. their junk insured. Okay, all right, I get that. If that's your livelihood, okay. But this guy who doesn't make his living with that insure, I don't know, that's just weird. That's like me being like, I want to insure my little toe. You probably use your little toe in a much different way than David Lee Roth uses his penis. Okay, yes. Thank God. I think that <laughs> I think that fans of yours may have different interests than fans of his. And I think that you also probably do a more rigorous um process of consideration in your partners. Okay, yes, I would I would hope so. That's not what you make your living with. Eh. But like yeah. I'm I'm ble- bleeding over here for health insurance. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Yeah. It's it's a lot. It just really stuck but. with me. I'm like, wait a second. Yeah. That's not even his life. Well, maybe to him in his mind, that's like. Yeah. Uh. Dude, I got dental insurance this month for the first time in Weird way to go eight from, years, from seven years. From... But no, literally what I'm saying, though, is that I have not had dental health insurance in my entire <laughs> adult life. And this man's like, huh, my wiener. And that <laughs> just makes me so wiener. mad. Right. And I'm like, can I like not have holes in my teeth anymore, please. <laughs> it just makes me so mad I, that we live in a country where people can have wiener insurance and you and I can barely get, like, our basic health needs taken care of. I'd really like some stomach lining, please. Yeah. <laughs> and eat the rich. But anyways, continue on right, with your that's, story. That's all I'm going to say about the penis matter and the alien abduction insurance. Oh, yeah, let's jump from that to mass suicide. That's going to be a fun transition. Woo! All right. So on March 19th, 1997, Marshall Applewhite taped himself in what he called Doe's final exit. Speaking of mass suicide and the only way to evacuate this earth. So after assessing that a spacecraft was trailing the comet hale bop I'm sorry, what? Hail, the hale bop comet? hale bop hale bop hale bop That just sounds so made up and not real to me. Okay. H-A-L-E hyphen B-O-P-P. No, I, I heard you, and I'm sure it's people's names, but it just sounded so, like... Oh, the diddly flute comet? <laughs> the squadorbum? <laughs> I think I'm having some, like, Hanson Mbop flashbacks. It's the Mbop Comet. I love Mbop. I know you That's do. That's still one of my ringtones just because of House, the show House. That was his ringtone. <laughs> okay. All right. The Mbop Comet comes. Yes. So trailing the Mbop Comet. And that this event would represent the closure to Heaven's Gate. So the gate's closing. This is their opportunity. T's got the spacecraft. She's... 
trail in the mbuck comment. Mm -hmm. Um, So he persuades 38 followers to prepare for a ritual suicide so that their souls can board the supposed craft. Supposedly. Supposedly. He believed that after their deaths, the UFO would take their souls to another level of existence above human, in which he described as being both physical and spiritual. He's moved way past this idea of metamorphosis, which we've talked about Mm -hmm. a lot by now. But I really like to reiterate that point because I I do think it's such a defining moment in the story. So they make this plan, and their plan to leave their vehicles or vessels, Mm -hmm. um, aka to kill themselves. The members were going to take um, phenobarbital mixed with applesauce or pudding, and it was going to be washed down with vodka. Additionally, they secured plastic bags around their heads after ingesting the mist, the mix, to induce asphyxiation. That just feels like a lot. Yeah. And also, I understand the lethal aspects of this, but if we're talking like a last meal situation, applesauce and vodka do not a happy (laughs) pair make. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like, can you they, not? They also had. They also had. I believe turkey pot pie was their last meal, and okay. they all had the same drink and stuff prior to this. Okay. I just feel like, can you not make a better cocktail with your phenobarbital than applesauce and vodka? Okay, what would you have? I don't know. Something with would you more drink? The, would it be Kool Aid? Dignity than that? No, not. Oh, that's bad. That's bad. Uh, I'm so sorry. The flavor aid. Um. Yeah, it is flavor aid. It, it is, is was not yeah. Kool Aid. Uh, I don't I don't know. It's just something so unpleasant. And I know none of this is pleasant. No. But like why put okay. Alright, continue. I'm I'm making mountains out of molehills. Uh so Ah, dang it, so. All thirty nine members were dressed in identical black shirts and sweatpants, brand new black and white Nike decades athletic yep. shoes, and an armband patches reading Heaven's Gate Away team. And this is one of the group's many instances of the use of Star Trek's fictional universe and and nomenclature. They they really did name quite a lot of their things off of inspiration or took inspiration from Star Trek. Uh, I hadn't mentioned this previously, but after T dies, uh, Doe kind of makes the entire group have what's similar to a wedding ceremony. Okay. Where they were provided with gold rings, and he wore a gold ring, and essentially they were marrying him, and he was marrying them. It got a little weird, but it was still very asexual. Okay. Um, so a lot of these members ha- also had their gold rings on. Mm-hmm. Each member had on their person $5 bill and three quarters in their pockets. All right. Can you guess why? I'm just going to see if you can take a stab in the dark at this one. Because 575 is the number of syllables in a haiku. I don't know. Okay. Each member symbolically took out their IDs, $5 and three quarters, so 575, and checked out of the house. Hmm. Um, it wasn't for a silly interplanetary toll. It was a humorous way to tell us that they all had left the planet permanently. I don't really know why, but some some people said, and in the documentary, I believe they made reference to it being an interplanetary toll. Like, that was the price to, to get on the UFO. And it was, at, it made reference in some book or some poem. Listen, this is cult logic. None of, I mean, none of this is real. And, and so right. you can make up whatever fee or toll road and alien travel that you want because it's all bullshit because you're a fucking cult. And then other former members talked about it um, being like the vagrancy fee. I, I guess I guess what I'm saying is there's a lot of supposed reasons that it was 575 yeah. that I'm now finding. Um, so take take whatever information you will there. Yeah. You might have noticed that I was talking about how they kind of did this in shifts. Right. I believe there were three shifts. Um, and so once a member was dead, a living member from the next shift would arrange the body by removing the plastic bed bag from the person's head, followed by positioning the body so that it was neatly on its own bed with faces and torsos covered by a square purple cloth for privacy. The identical clothing was used as a uniform for the mass super- suicide to represent unity. Remember, they're trying to be a crew here. Right. Um, and crews, much like Star Trek, yeah. they dress similar. There's a uniform there. But also, it's a way of, in cult logic, of controlling an individual's individuality yeah. and need Suppressing to be it. themself. To yeah. suppress that. Now, the Nike decades were chosen specifically because the group got a good deal on the shoes. <laughs> Fair, yeah, I guess. 
frugal. Um, Doe, or that guy, was also a fan of Nikes, and therefore everyone was expected to wear and like Nikes within the group. Heaven's Gate uh, also had a saying within the group, just do it, which of course is Nike's slogan. And which, you Shia know. LaBeouf's. Yeah. <laughs> don't, you know I love don't, I I have a weird thing for still. Don't let like your I, dreams be dreams. I just, I don't know. <laughs> I hope Shia gets his life together. I really do. Yeah. We Someday all do. maybe maybe I'll have a little crush on him again. But <laughs> till then. So there were thirty nine adherents, twenty one women, and eighteen men, and they were all between the ages of twenty six and seventy two. Mm. They've believed to have died in three groups over three successive days, which is a long time if you're in that third group. Yeah. I don't know. I might be rethinking some choices. Yeah. But then, like, are you going to face charges for that if you leave and you're in group three? I don't know. I mean, there's there's so much to be said. Any decent defense team could be, like, high brainwashing. Right. You know, I mean, there's there's so much protection legally that I don't think you're culpable. You might at most cop a misdemeanor for, okay. like, handling the bodies. Like, there may be some weird stuff with that. Anything but I don't there. think that I don't think that you are culpable um that being said don't go out and help your friends well no of of course not okay so uh, the the uh, the groups were groups of anywhere between 15 and 9 depending on where and um among the dead were interestingly enough Thomas Nicholas, who is the brother of actress Nichelle Nicholas, who's best known for her role as Euthura in the original Star Trek. Mm-hmm. Um, he was the third to last member to die, uh, Doe was, and two people remained after him, and they were believed to be those nurses that I spoke about right. earlier as yeah. helping in the, um, because they would have had the most experience with yeah. medical, medical things, yeah. though I wouldn't trust them with a castration. If I was a nurse, I wouldn't trust myself with that procedure. Like, I'd be like, mm, that's, not my that's wheelhouse. A little, a little, a little above yeah. the pig, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So Doe was the third to last member to die, and he was placed in a queen-size bed in his own room. Okay. Two people remained after him, uh, the nurses that we discussed, and they were found with bags over their heads and not having purple cloths over covering their top hats. And that's how we believe that they were the last to go, is they right. were able to remove the bags from their heads and cover themselves with the purple cloths. Mm-hmm. Uh, similar sets of packages were sent to numerous Heaven's Gate affiliated or formally affiliated members, including um, at least one media outlet. And this is this is going to be... A not-so-great part of this story, in my opinion. So, mm. most of these packages contained two VHS tapes. One with Doe's final exit that he had recorded, um, with him speaking about why they were doing that. And the other with farewell messages of groups of followers. These farewell messages can be found in a lot of Heaven's Gate documentaries, including Heaven's Gate Cold Occult on HBO. Max, I really, if you're interested in this, look into it more. It's from a psychological standpoint, I think it's so interesting to see how their mannerisms had changed, yeah. how these people had lost their individuality. The way they spoke about different things is, it's not disjointed, but you very much feel a detachment to it. Right. I just, I think it's worth watching for anyone. Yeah. Honestly. In these videos, they, many members state, we have exited our vehicles just as we had entered them. One man uh, informed the boss, uh, his boss of the, content of the packages all right so there was a former member although here in this one particular article i'm referencing here it says that it was a member of the media but in the documentary that i was watching and they interviewed the guy i believe he was a former member okay maybe he was both yeah they're just kind of disjointed who knows but he receives this package and and he receives a letter Okay. In the documentary, they talk about how this guy was a former member, and he had a vision, or had the calling, as he said it, that he was meant to do something beyond leave with the group, but for the group. So he goes to Doe with this theory that, hey, I feel like I'm meant to do something more, I feel like I'm meant to tell the story, and Doe goes, okay, go out and live your life and just keep keep our knowledge alive. 
Okay. It should be also stated that there were two members left alive to manage the website, and the website for Heaven's Gate is still functional today. Jeez. Um, so this member receives a letter, and I believe two of these tapes, that says, you know, we've left our vehicles. I need you to take a video camera here, and I want you to capture everything you see. Wow. He goes in with the video camera and indeed videotapes uh, the remains of these individuals who had taken their lives. Um, And he calls his boss. His boss goes with him and his boss who's waited outside basically encourages him. All right, you need to make some calls to the authorities. I believe there's another member that had left at this time that also received a letter saying, hey, if you if you get this, call the authorities. Mm -hmm. Um, We've decided to leave. So all this is kind of taking place around the same time. There is a a call made, um, I believe, possibly even two. So the San Diego County Sheriff's Department receives an anonymous tip through the 911 system at 3.15 p.m. on March 26th, suggesting they do a welfare check on the residents days after the suicide. This caller is later to be revealed as D'Angelo, the man who went in, videotaped. Uh, Here's a little bit of how that conversation went. Caller. Yes, I need to report an anonymous hit tip. Who do I speak to? Sheriff's Department. Okay, regarding what? Caller. This is regarded a mass suicide, and I can give you the address. He gives the address. Um, I'm not going to give the yeah. address, because if this place is still around, obviously, I don't want people to trespass. Right. Or, that's, that's not cool. You know, people left, lost, lost their yeah. loved ones in this. The single deputy who first responds to the call enters the home through a side door, and the first thing he sees is ten bodies. And, of course, he's overcome with this very strong odor that you hear a lot of first responders right. talk to, talk about in forms of death. They were already decomposing in the really hot California spring. Yeah. So they do a search, and two deputies find no one alive. Both retreated until a search warrant were procured. Mm. And all 39 bodies were ultimately cremated. Wow. The Heaven's Gate event will widely go down in history as one of the mass examples of mass suicide. Yep. And when news broke of the suicides and the relation to the comet Mbop or Hale Bop, uh, the discoverer of the comet, Alan Hale, who I want to call Alan mm, now, but is not, <laughs> he was drawn to the story. And apparently, his phone, quote unquote, has just never stopped ringing since. Mm. He spoke on the subject at a press conference, but only after researching details of the incident, which I think is a wise move on his behalf. This, what gets me here is that I know as a comedy podcast, we talk about this and, and we can make light of a situation, but there were people who lost their family members who just disappeared out of their lives right. altogether. And there's one moment where I believe um, these these members are allowed to go home and reconnect with their family members right before this event happens. And so there was so much hope there yeah. for these family members that maybe maybe they were getting close to coming back. Maybe they were going to reenter their lives. Yeah. The two former members that maintain the group's website and are still part of the group today are Mark and Susan King of Phoenix, Arizona. At least three former members of the Heaven's Gate cult ultimately decided to take their lives. They either committed or contemplated suicide themselves in the months after the mass suicide event, including on May 6, 1997, Wayne Cook and Chuck Humphreys attempted suicide in a hotel in a manner similar used to the group. They had entered the religious group or the cult as lovers at the time. Wow. And so it's a little heartbreaking. One of them passed away. Cook died and Humphrey survived this attempt. Mm. I watched so many interviews of this man who's heartbroken one that he lost his loved one but beyond that he feels immense survivor's guilt oh i'm sure and they're asking him in these interviews i mean you're not going to do it again right and he says i can't promise that Mm -hmm. because he thinks at the time that the spacecraft has moved on but the gate is still open for him until doe and t decide to close it and he goes I don't know. Um, And he talks about how he believes that gate is still open for him if he chooses to go that route. Wow. Another former member, James Pickery Jr., committed suicide by a self-inflicted gunshot wound on May 11th. I want to know, like, as someone who's lost a couple people in my life to suicide, I don't like using the word suicide. Mm -hmm. I hate that. I I don't know why it gets me so upset. Um, I think because it sounds like, like, I don't know. I just feel like if you're in that mindset... Mm -hmm. it isn't 
a choice. People say yeah. it's a choice, but I also feel like you're losing, in many cases, a battle with mental illness. Right. I don't feel like it should be compared to patricide or homicide in yeah. that well, sense. Well, and that's that's why I like the phrasing died by suicide. I know it's going out of vogue to say committed suicide, which has been like the thing for a yeah, long time. Yeah, committed suicide I yeah. hate. I like I like took their own yeah. lives, which because I think like died um, by suicide also demonstrates that it is a thing that, while self inflicted, yes, happens to you. It is it is the the right. loss of a battle that has been waging probably for a really long time. That and if you look at these individuals, I. I I, you know, they've been stripped of their yeah. identity. They've conformed to this ideals. They've been mm-hmm. brainwashed for such a long time that I believe, in a sense, they did lose their yeah. own battles. Um, Humphrey, who survived his first suicide attempts, ultimately took his life in February of 1990. Wow. <gasps> no, that's new news to me. Mm. I mean, I, I think I yeah, saw it, but I, it didn't stick with Michael. me. So the man who lost... Right, who lost his his lover and who said that he was going wow. to potentially leave that gate open for himself did in fact mm. his life. And there are lots of family members that still find themselves reeling watching the videos of their loved ones saying goodbye. I can't even imagine having that. If you've lost a family member to a cult or a religious group, or if you are looking to leave a cult or a re- or religious group. There are lots of resources out there, including familiesagainstcultteachings.org um, that has support groups uh, that provides re-education programs. And if you are interested in that, the number for familiesagainstcultteachings.org is one eight seven seven three six zero fact and FACT is 3228. You can also report anonymously online a cult, receive victim support, and tell your own story to reach out to others. And I just want to follow up that uh, if you are in a dark place, we talk about this a lot, there is absolutely nothing wrong with getting help. Uh, And if you feel that you're in crisis, the National Suicide Hotline is 1-800-273-8255. And that being said, Rue... I need to I need to hear a story that's different. <laughs> that's not about a cult and Yeah, since I've been doing this for three weeks now. Yeah. Um, I'm okay. ready to get out of Heaven's Gate for a bit and, and get into the world of Rue. Ooh, I like that. I believe this is our first that isn't Haunted Holidays. Oh no, baby. It's still Haunted Holidays. <gasps> Is it haunted holidays? Is are we having a haunted New Year's? We are having a haunted <gasps> New Year. Yay! What is your favorite New Year's tradition? Hmm. Okay. So I just learned about this one last year, and like everything else that's good in my life, COVID has squandered it. Oh, uh, no. Here in here in Germany, they do fireworks at midnight, like on the scale of American Fourth of July. Oh, that's really cool. And it was so beautiful and it's just like how in the states people will just like buy fireworks and shoot them off with their friends Uh and where my apartment is is a really close to our base which did some fireworks but we're also directly next door to a little market which has at midnight an empty parking lot and so people just stood in the parking lot and shot off fireworks and you could hear giggling and watch the pretties and that was pretty darn cool I love it the best fireworks I've ever seen in my life was I was flying into LAX from Casey nice and it was right at the time when all of LA was launching their fireworks and I was descending onto uh kind of the runway but before that as we made our descent you looked around and in every direction there were fireworks going up not like close to the plane but you know below the plane and I had never seen it it was magical that's cool yeah unfortunately this year with COVID um we we are under curfew but also because of the injuries that are sustained because you're dealing with explosives right the hospitals just can't handle it and so they've banned it this year oh but yeah well maybe you can try out one of my favorite new year's traditions then oh okay okay so oh i got a cat in my lap i'm sorry they're gonna be extra clingy because they haven't been allowed to be around me for two days until i got that covid test yeah um so okay my favorite new year's tradition is the gold coin tradition you go get some chocolate gold coins and you're supposed to eat them on new year's eve and that's supposed to symbol financial abundance in the next year and my mom and i have been doing it for three or four years now and i gotta say the only year we missed it was last year which is this year now so sorry how dare you i guess 2020 was on me my bad 
I know you're like not feeling good, but you need to get your shit together so you can eat some chocolate on what is it Thursday? I'm gonna send you some chocolate via okay. <laughs> Amazon so we can all do it. All right, yeah, we we need to close this circle or whatever happened. And- Listeners, go out or you know don't go out. Order some uh, chocolate coins from home and please on midnight eat those if you're not yeah. kissing your loved one, which I will not be. Or do so. both, <laughs> just like Lady and the Tramp, some chocolate coins. Yeah, you know, yeah. split it. We're not gonna there judge, you, go. you know. Yeah. Yeah. I can't remember the last time I had a New Year's kiss. You? Aww. Oh. I'm I'm married. Oh, don't Jessie. be sad for me. Oh yeah. Crap. Never I'm mind. I'm sorry. Right. Next topic. <laughs> I was like, yeah, last year and also this year and hopefully many years to come. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. You're <laughs> like, how about you? And I was like, uh, <laughs> uh like every year, Jesse, I'm like, oh, I'll just I'll kiss this cat. Happy there New Year's, Rocket. Well, let me talk about some other traditions that you can yes! participate in instead of not getting a kiss. Uh, so I figured since this year has been so bad and terrible and awful, I'd share some curious customs from around the world that are said to bring some luck in the New Year, because goodness knows we could all use some. I love it, and I will share if I want to partake of that okay. instead of a New Year's kiss this year. Love it. And also, only kiss people in your bubble. Please don't kiss strangers. Yeah, there is still a don't pandemic. Kiss, don't kiss outside the bubble. Don't kiss outside the bubble. <laughs> uh, okay. So, most of these traditions aren't scary. And especially, like, okay. if you're a part of the culture they belong to, they're not scary for you, really. Like, they may appear bizarre or unusual to us uncultured Americans. But yeah, so none of them are really scary, but I'll probably start off 2020 with a bang and cover some kind of gruesome murder. But I'm glad we didn't back-to-back really sad stuff this week. I'm glad. Well, we knew what was happening. Yeah. We communicated Yeah, for we once. don't do that a lot, but good no. job us. Yay, uh, high five. Woo! Digital high five. Boom. Uh, all right. Haunted holidays. Haunted holidays. All right. In Ireland, it used to be customary to bang a loaf of bread against the walls, either to ward off evil spirits or to ensure that the next year was prosperous. I will be doing that this year. Okay. Uh, Check. I couldn't find why that started, how banging it on the wall or why bread, like, I don't know why. Maybe because it wouldn't hurt the walls, but I'm here for it. Anything I'm making that- a list of okay. New Year's should I- Okay, so bang, bread on walls if someone found my phone they'd be so confused about 90 percent of the stuff i have oh same i'm like scared to go to prison based on the like (laughs) podcast notes on my phone like how is this murder done i'm like oh probably shouldn't know about cyanide (laughs) it's fine (laughs) the irish also believe that you should start the year off with a clean home and would spend the 31st cleaning their homes from top to bottom to make sure they'd start the new year fresh i kind of like this one i like it but i'll take it or leave it at this point yeah it's fine I'd rather not spend my New Year's cleaning. I probably will, yeah. but you know what? I did find out I'm Irish this year. Maybe I should have an Irish New Year's. So bang some wall on the bread and... Yeah. Bang some wall on the bread. <laughs> I was just going to let it slide. You're sick. I'm so sick, Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> it's been days without sleep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, like, I put away our Christmas stuff today. I mean, don't get too excited. The bin's still in the living room. But I put our tree it down and, and everything, and I was like, this feels really nice. So maybe I'll clean up some too okay i'll i'll think about it okay probably will do that i think considering it is half the battle and kind of counts look i don't mind cleaning i just clean every day so if it's new year's like give me a day off Eh, give me a day off. Yeah, people in Argentina also like to start the new year fresh and will spend the afternoon of the 31st shredding documents from the previous year and then they throw those shreds out the window like confetti, which I'm not into the littering part, but it right. sounds pretty. The document shredding is always a great idea. Yeah. I don't know about using it as confetti yeah. for things, but okay. Um, yeah. No, I'm not going to do that one just because of the littering. And also, I don't have a shredder, so it'd take a lot of time to cut that in strips. But. Yeah. I l- Plus, I haven't done taxes yet. I like the idea of how it, because they do it to symbolize leaving the past year behind. And I like I, that. Because, man, I, I, like I want to never think about this year again. <laughs> Can we just, like, throw a bank statement out the window crumpled and then go pick it up and throw it away later, you know? Sure. That can be the American right. version. It's half-hearted. <laughs> it loses some of the charm. But yeah. <laughs> it's perfect. All right. So this one, we're, we're getting into some food stuff. Ooh, I love food. So in Spain. Usually. Well, yeah, not this week, maybe. 
In Spain, there's a tradition called Las Doce Uvas de la Suerte, which is the 12 lucky grapes. And with this tradition, <laughs> at, mid- into it. at midnight, people have like a bowl of 12 grapes. And with each stroke of the clock at midnight, you have to eat a grape. And if you don't okay. get through them all, however many grapes you didn't eat is how many months of bad luck you'll have. Okay, fine, I'll eat 12 grapes. <laughs> can, can they be purple? Sure, they can be whatever you okay. want. I, I was really hoping tapas would be involved there, because I am always down for tapas. Tapas is my favorite type of food, I think. Like, oh. anything snacky is my jam. I could live on charcuterie boards. The first time I ever had tapas, I didn't know that you were, like, supposed to share, and I'm a, kind of a picky eater. <laughs> So I ordered my own thing because I don't eat any seafood yeah. or, um, so I ordered my own thing and then they brought everybody's food out and I'm getting ready to eat my little steak thing mm-hmm. that I had and then everyone started passing the plates around in my <laughs> plate and I watched my steak disappear oh, and no. I didn't even get any and I was like, <laughs> oh. I was stuck with everyone's shrimp that I don't eat. Jeez. So, it was a heartbreaking moment. It sounds so sad. <laughs> I, I know the feeling where you're like, because I've had it happen before with tapas where, like, I was excited to try something, and by the time and it, it made gone. it to me, it was gone. I was like, oh, okay, that's fine. I think tapas is ideal for two to four people, yeah. but you need to have enough food for that. Yeah. And ideally, you have, like, six pieces for four people, so that if there's one you really like, you can go back for a little, a little more. Like, if you're two people having tapas, order food for four people. Yeah. Exactly. If you're four people having tapas, uh, you should just spend like you're you're having ten people fed. Pretty much. In my tapas, it, it it like multiplies exponentially. Yeah. Yeah. It has to keep going. Up. I want tapas cubed. I want tapas right now. Yeah. No. Okay. So when <sighs> back in the before times, and like I think it was January before in the before yeah time. before everything went to hell, we went to Barcelona. And oh, you went to Barcelona. But can I just swoop, swoon for that for a second? Yeah. Ah, oh, I don't know. Maybe it's the Ed Sheeran song about Barcelona, but <laughs> like tapas Barcelona. Yes, please. But so we if throw in throw in some ocean activity, and I'm there. It was so freezing cold. Okay, there maybe was not no if it's ocean activity. Cold. It was like the wind was blowing sideways. We went to a Barca game and like froze to death the whole time, but got to watch Messi win. That was cool. But no. Okay. So I would really worry about Darnell having any sort of ocean activity at this point anyway, since your lake incident. Yeah. That was before the lake incident, but yeah. I know. Yeah. We could have maybe avoided the lake incident had we had ocean (laughs) activities. But anyways, so we're in Barcelona and we're thinking, tapas spanish wine oh yeah yes. let's do it and so we booked yes. a we booked a wine tour because when we went to rome we did a wine tour and had the most fabulous time ever i'll tell that story sometime maybe i'll do a rome episode because it was probably one of the coolest experiences i've ever had in my life stop like oh i want to go to rome and drink wine and see pompeii and eat olives from a dish anytime is that weird no i want to pick an olive from a bush and i want to eat it okay and that's been like a life goal of mine for ever i'm here for it just anytime that you get to like oh rue gets to go cool places remember that i like don't get to see my family for a year at a time i would welcome <laughs> oh <laughs> but i also don't get no, to see you no. for a year at a time I love my mom. I know. I haven't seen her for about a year at this point. Like, if that meant I got to go to Rome and Barcelona and have tapas and drink wine and see Pompeii, and one of the places I've always wanted to go in Rome is this ancient Roman dump. I know that sounds terrible. Oh, I'm here for it. But it's like all of these ancient Roman uh, olive oil vessels just scattered across the ground, and it's like... It's like a time capsule in place, and you can mm. hold the pottery, and ugh. Yeah. Just give me that olives and tapas, and like, I, I, ugh. There you go. Okay, sorry. I'll stop. No, I'll stop you're fine. I'll, I'll tell my Rome story another time. What I'm trying to get at is, so we had this great experience in Rome. We're like, yeah, let's do that again in Barcelona, because might as well. So it's this wine tour with tapas, and the guy who hosts it was a fun gentleman to be around. We had a great time. Uh-huh. I met some girls from the Midwest there who were wow. awesome, and we spent the whole night chatting about theater and feminism and being from the Midwest and missing our families. And I feel like you do that everywhere you go, because didn't you go somewhere else and do that as well? Uh, you made some friends? Oh, and, at and then... Oktoberfest, yeah, but they weren't from the Midwest. They were just from okay. everywhere. But anyway, 
so we're on this tour, and during our our Roman wine tour, we were like, oh yeah, we can. The the um host of the tour, the tour guide, was like a wine expert and was like can you note that this has like notes of sea salt and blah 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 blah. and I was like oh cool I learned a lot about wine so we go on this Barcelona tour and thank god there was food Jesse because for as (laughs) much (laughs) for as much fun as this gentleman was like me and Darnell were primed to have this wine experience and we were like oh what can you tell us about this wine and, like, this man did everything short of pick up the bottle and go, um, well, it says, uh, <laughs> Merlot, and, um, it's, it's red, you can see, um, Aww. smells like, um, like wine, kind of? Like, I mean, that would be me trying to lead a wine tour. It's, uh, it's in a bottle that's got a tree on it. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty much what. So I'm glad. 1994. I'm glad that there was at least really, really delicious tapas involved because it was mostly just hey, let's walk to different bars and have snacks, which I'm here for. But like, love it. Let's not call that a wine tour. Let's call that a a walk and munch tour or something. (laughs) I would. I'd sign up for. Oh, it was so much fun, and we stayed out until like 4 a.m. But. It was not a a wine tour in the traditional sense of the word. Have I ever told you about the time I got hired by the liquor company as an actor to be their brand ambassador? I've done this a couple times. Um, one was for a tequila company. Right. At one point, I was I was even a a table a margarita table. Um, this other time, they're like, "Hey, in this place, it paid mm-hmm. super well. Like for a couple weeks, I got a couple." Well, not even a couple weeks, maybe like five days, I got a couple grand, and I was like, ooh. Yeah, and they'd send me to liquor stores, and one of the liquor stores they sent me to, I had to do an Irish accent, and they hired me as my little redhead self yeah. to do kind of like a an Irish cream okay. drink, right? Yeah. So I'd be like, a, a top of the morning tea, a sample of the cream, or whatever. That's yeah. not how I did it. I did it better, hopefully. <laughs> maybe not. Well, now you know you're actually Irish, too, so that's cool. Right, but I got hit on by a wine guy that very much reminds me of your wine guy. And the, I was stationed, like, right next to him, and the whole time he kept walking up to me with red wine and being like, you want this? I'm like, I'm working. Okay. He's like, you're not Irish. And I'm like, you don't know anything about wine. Go away. <laughs> that just makes me think of the Bob's Burgers episode when they're on the train with the wine snob. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's... uh. You can eat 12 grapes. Okay, 12 grapes. Yep. Yes, on my list. Is smash a loaf of bread into the wall. Does it? Can it be sourdough? Sure. You know what? It's just going to be Wonder Bread. Okay. Why, why make just the Just one piece happen? of bread. Okay, I'll send you a video okay. of me smashing one bread, piece of bread into the wall on midnight and New Year's because that's how sad. I love it. Terrible my life is this year. <laughs> that feels very fitting for this year. Yeah, it's a good, it's a 2020. Yep. And then I'll eat some 12 grapes. There you go. Okay, what's next? What else can I do? Next, we're heading to the Philippines, where it's also customary to eat grapes, and they believe that round shapes symbolize prosperity, so they'll collect 12 round fruits, so like grapes, watermelons, oranges, cantaloupes, etc. Uh, I mean, watermelon's they... a little oblong, but okay. No, they have like the seedless baby watermelons. Oh, truth. Yeah. Okay. I wasn't thinking seedless baby watermelon. This is why, this is your story, man. Take it. Get with the program, man. You gotta get you a baby watermelon. Oh, and sounds like I'm going to be eating a lot of fruit and my grocery bill is going to be ridiculous this New Year's. Starting off healthy. Uh, they also wear polka dots and carry coins in their pockets. Okay, well, I can put some coins in my pockets and... Some chocolate oh. coins, even. Yes, because I have to eat those, too. Um, Do yep. I have polka, do- polka dots? No. I'm not a polka dot person. I have a horror movie where I was in a polka dot dress and I get turned into a giant killer doll. Um, oh, and the doll that I've had that you've seen that I get yeah. turned into, she's got polka dots on. So maybe I'll just carry okay. her in a pocket or a purse next to my coins. That's a choice you can it... make. <laughs> like, <laughs> you can the... carry your haunted doll self around. I guess technically all of these are choices I could make. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just going to be you with like your creepy haunted doll under your arm eating watermelon by the spoonful. <laughs> counting grapes and Christy yep. walks in and I smash bread onto the wall and she's like, Jesse, you need to get out. <laughs> and then she has an exorcism. I'm like, we need, we need to get you kissed, girl. 
<laughs> it's been a while. Does uh, the bubble count as something round? Your COVID bubble. <laughs> yes. Sure. Why not? <laughs> okay. All right. One of the spookiest looking New Year's traditions we're going to talk about comes yeah. from Ecuador, okay. where people Ooh. burn effigies called Año Viejo, or the Old Year. And this tradition started amidst the 1895 breakout of yellow fever, or, you know, in a pandemic. Oh, okay, so we should definitely do that one then. Burn an effigy. Does it have to be a person? Can we well, burn an effigy we... of, like, 2020 and then burn that? Well, let me give you some ideas. Please do. So, during that outbreak, people packed coffins with the clothes of the dead. That's a little great. And can't find those. maybe that was a way to, like, quell the outbreak based on the newly proposed germ theory, or maybe it was more symbolic. I'm not really sure where that came from. It can be but both. But they set them on fire as, like, a purification rite. So today, coffins are no longer used, but households will create, like, scarecrows with okay. old newspaper and then put a mask of... And this is where it gets a little strange. All right. Either, like, a character, like, I saw some that were, like, Bender from Futurama, or Gambit from X-Men, or... Okay. <laughs> or Spongebob, or, like, a political figure that they don't like. I don't know. I don't contone burning effigies of anyone, no matter how much I dislike yeah. them. But, in this case, it's traditional, so burn your Bender. Yeah. Burn, burn... Yeah, you know. And so they kind of like almost look like pinatas like they're mm-hmm. this papery paper mache kind of constructed like a dora pinata i don't know why that was the first pinata that came to mind um and so people parade these giant effigies through the street and when i say giant i mean like two stories high wow and then they like, set that on fire yes i'm and, not and graceful the ones- enough for this one i'm taking this one <laughs> off the list and the ones that like n- regular people make they'll make like three feet high or whatever but they'll yeah. have like an, a parade of giant effigies bender from futurama okay. yeah and so during the night men will dress up as widows of the effigies oh okay and go through the crowds mourning and begging people for money okay so we got some drag too all right yeah yeah, all yeah. Right. Um, it's a very sad drag show. It's like, yes, still give me money, but, like, I'm just crying and wearing black. Like, honestly, this is my ideal. <laughs> That's your ideal drag show? It kind of is. Okay. Um, it's like... I'm not graceful enough for this tradition, so I will sit it out. I do think the effigy and burning and, like, cleansing for the new year, right on. Would it count if I took this shirt that I had a COVID test in today and I burned it in a shoebox while I banged bread into the wall? I think that that is a wonderful Americanization of this tradition. I don't know. I kind of like the shirt. I think I'm going to keep yeah, it. It's cute. Yeah. It's Stitch Fix. Oh. Yeah. Which should sponsor us. There but you go. But doesn't. But doesn't. <laughs> Much like uh, everybody else. Well, yeah. Yet. So since you're not graceful enough for the regular just hanging out with the effigy, you're definitely not graceful enough for the uh, tradition where some ambitious people will take the challenge of jumping the burning effigies 12 times <laughs> oh, to encourage yeah. good luck in no. each of the 12 months ahead. No, Okay, look, I could get one of those worry dolls and set that on fire and I can jump over that 12 times, but beyond okay. that, I'm sitting this one out. I, I just feel like I would be... Like Michael in the office when he has to walk the burning coal yes. and just lays down. <laughs> that would be me. I'd be like, oh, God, it's so bad. Okay. So this is like my, those were kind of little tapas, if you will, little samplers. This is kind of the main attraction. Oh. That was such a beautiful segue. I'm so glad for the conversation we had because that was just, I couldn't have planned it that way. Uh, so this is kind of my big story. This is the, the entree. All right. So we are headed to Oga, Japan. I'm, I'm ready for it. And this is your disclaimer that I don't speak Japanese. All right. So this is going to be the most tough love tradition that we cover. Oh, Okay. And this tradition is that of the Namahage, who are men who dress up with intimidating masks and cover themselves in grass, like, tunics or coats. <gasps> I've seen this, yes. And go house to house, shouting, are there any crybabies here? Any kids who don't listen to their parents? Does the woman of the house wake up early? I haven't seen that. And I'm, so I'm not a f- huge fan of 
the does the woman of the house wake up early? Because it feels a little misogynistic. What is that? Um, like, what are they picking out there? Of course she probably does. She has kids. She has shit to do. Well, but I think She's it's like, are, like, are you lazy? Like, do you get up on time with your kids or are you not doing what you're supposed to be? Oh, okay. But also, like, it feels a little misogynistic, but also I feel a little called out because I am the lady of my house and I roll out of bed at a cool 830. <laughs> That's not bad. Yeah. Let's put it this way. I'm up by like 7.30 and I read and play chess and spend too much time on Twitter. And then I get moving. (laughs) I messaged you your time last night. So I was up. Yeah. Which was like 2 a.m. my time. Yeah, that's because it was 9 a.m. for me. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So you were up. You were doing things. Yeah. You were up with your child, who's basically me. (laughs) My child had a sick tummy last night. She kept me up all night, texting me weird <laughs> stuff. <laughs> bro, bro, pay attention to me. <laughs> Basically, yeah. All right, so the Namahage are said to be visiting gods who come at the new year to warn against laziness in the year ahead and to bring good fortune and harvest, plentiful food, and to protect against illness and disasters. So, Where boy, were oh they boy, last year? we could use some Namahage lovin'. Sounds like a like a Kenny G album that didn't get greenlit. Oh my god. I don't know. Or something, you know, Michael okay. Bolton maybe. No, Bolton's too cool for that. Yeah, he's pretty he's pretty cool. Although I mean, ever since Jack he, Sparrow, like Knowing like the when, tradition, like I think I think this could be up Bolton's alley. I think we might want to pitch this to him. Alright. The people who welcome the Namahage into their home offer them traditional food. So we're kinda getting some Mary Lloyd vibes here. A little bit. I was kind of having a flashback to the yeah. rap battle with the horse skeleton. A little bit, yeah. And, okay, so n- now the Night of the Namahage is celebrated on the 31st of December, but traditionally this was a Lunar New Year celebration. Okay. So, which this year is going to be on February 12th. That's my birthday! Oh, shit, it is, isn't it? Yeah, wait, what's happening on my birthday? We're the Lunar New Year. Lunar New Year. Oh, yeah. that's kind of cool that the Lunar New Year happens on my birthday. Yeah. That's got to be some good astrological juju, right? I would hope so. I will say that this coming year is like a lucky number birth for me, so I'm hoping okay. good things will come. Yeah. Yeah. I'm into it. All right. Like many of the historic traditions that we've talked about on Haunted Holidays. Haunted Holidays. It has gotten less popular over the years, but much like with the Mary Lloyd, it's seeing a resurgence in popularity from people who want to keep in touch with their roots and traditions and customs. Uh, And it actually was declared an important and tangible cultural asset in 1978. Wow. I Right on. Yeah. I love keeping culture alive. I think it's so important. I do, too. I do, too. Are there Um, any traditions that that you maybe not aren't the most known or something that you want to bring back through your life or with your children or anything like that when you have them? I'm sure that the answer is yes. Mm-hmm. I just don't know that I can think of any right now. Okay. I have two that just like immediately come to mind. Okay. They're like wedding traditions though, if that ever happens. Which okay. <laughs> eh. Anyway. Um, so the first is the hand fasting ceremony. I think yeah. that's beautiful. It's Celtic. It's so based in tradition. Yeah. And I kind of like this one, although I don't know that my, my mom's going to go for it, but okay. here we go. Um, so, in Celtic tradition, the bride's family would present the man, the groom, with a sword. Oh. And this is kind of a symbol that, like, he's the house protector and, and things like that. Um, but I don't know. I'm always up for a sword, I guess. <laughs> Yo, I'm I'm here for it. I like that idea. It, it'd be cool to be like, oh, that's <clears throat> the symbolic sword of, I don't know. I just yeah. kind of think that's cool. I am glad that's not a tradition we participated in because I a, don't. You don't want your family to give Darnell a sword? I don't want Darnell to have a sword given how many <laughs> times we run out of paper towels and the empty paper towel tube becomes a mini lightsaber for my 30-year-old husband. I I was just offering, like, in my mind, I'm like, oh, I should send Darnell, like, I think we're family. I should send him a sword on your family's behalf, you know? Please don't. Please don't. Please nope. don't. Okay. <laughs> All right. Fair. L- like... The amount of times that he, even without anything in his hands, will just hold his hands and 
And like a seven-year-old boy, ching, ching, and I'm just like, what are you? I can so see him and hear him doing that I'm right like, now. I'm like, I'm making dinner. What are you doing? And he's like, oh, oh, it got me. And I'm like, okay. And he what like, if it's he... a Nerf sword? Can I send him a Nerf sword on behalf of your family? Especially not, because if it's a live steel one, he will respect it at least a little bit. A Nerf sword is going to slap me in the ass more times than I know what to do with. Okay, <laughs> He'll be like, stab, right. stab, stab. I'm like, I, I'm trying to make you dinner. <laughs> Damn it, Jesse. <laughs> yeah, literally. I will curse your name every single day. Uh, please don't. Okay, so the na- the name Namahage comes from the word Namomi, which in the Akita dialect refers to the blisters that people would get on their hands and feet from sitting near the hearth all winter. And I'm like, Aww. you need to back up a little bit, my friend. If you Sew are sitting a rug. so close to the fire that you're getting blisters, you're too close. Blankets, man. Blankets or just scoop back a little bit. Like, I know it's cold. Trust me, I'm in Germany, I know it's cold. But, like, scooch back. (laughs) It's still gonna be warm, like, a foot back. Right, and you won't... Where you're not gonna be cooked. Set yourself on fire, yeah. Right. But anyway, so these Namomi are the blisters that you would get. And so, Namomi Hagi means peeling off the blisters, which is a metaphor for not being lazy. Oh! I I know. Okay. I know. Alright. Oh, that just sounds... I know. I, I, yeah. And so this idea of Namomi Hagi is a metaphor for not being lazy. And over time, this actually became a greeting during the new year. And the word turned into Namahage. So kind of like contracted, like, good morning. So basically, they walk around and they say, don't be lazy. Basically, yeah. I don't I don't like that tradition. A little laziness is okay, guys. I, yeah. No, as long as you're getting your stuff done, if yeah. you want to veg a little, yeah. you do you, you know? Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about the Namahage's appearance, because it's just spectacular. These folks are a sight to see. Okay. First off, they carry around a Deba Bocho, which is a big knife used to cut off the Namomi. The blisters? Yeah, please don't hack at my blisters with a, a knife, guys. Ah! Uh, I know. Uh, I know. This is worse than the alien abduction. Oh, uh. Okay. Like, you you got weirded out because they, they clipped her fingernails. Yeah. And here, uh, yep. this guy's walking around with a blister cutting knife? Yep. No. And they're uh-uh. they're big, too. They're like chef's knife. Yeah, no. Okay. Mm, okay. All right. They also carry a gohe, which okay. is a sacred wooden wand decked out with streamers, and that symbolizes their Shinto god status. Okay. So it's a symbol of their divinity, basically. All right. They also... Divinity symbol I'm here for. They also wear masks, which were traditionally made of bark, carved wood, and paper mache. Now they're made by local artisans, and they're incredible. The Oh, that's really cool. The masks look like what I think a lot of us think of as traditional Japanese gods or deities or... Some would say demons, kind of whatever. A lot of, like, the tattoos that you see that are Japanese style, so they're the kind of domineering eyes. Are they they called kabuki tattoos? I'm not sure. I'm not educated enough to give you an answer. Okay. Um, But they also often have horns and, like, big teeth. They're they're pretty awesome. And finally, they wear kendes, which are big coats made of woven grass, which are also symbols of their divinity. And on their... Okay, so, sorry, I don't mean to stop you. I just wanted to ask you, is this, like... What a person looks like. This is a kabuki tattoo. Can you um, see that? Am I doing any justice yeah, to that? more or less. Yeah. Okay, so kind of like yeah. that. Yep, you're good. I see it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, kind of similar Yeah, that's to that. a kabuki tattoo. Okay. Um, Yay! I feel so cultured that I knew yeah. that for a second. Uh, so they wear these kende coats, and then they also, on their legs, wear grass shin guards called habaki, which represent that they're from somewhere else. And on their feet, they wear snow boots made of grass called waragutsu, which help them walk the long distance into the village because it's said that they, like, live on the mountain and come down and oh, cool. do their blister chopping. Uh, I know. Uh, I, uh, yeah, it's not ideal. Do that in soup pans and I'm off this call. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, I, I just thought those were some cool traditions. Those are really cool and traditions. They're, like I said, they're, the thing with a lot of these folklore for haunted holidays is that 
it's haunted holidays. haunted holidays is that it's so closed or unfortunately faded through time that it's hard to find a lot on them but i'm happy to resurrect some of these traditions and maybe we'll bring some of them into our new year and god willing have a better 2021 so if you're out there eat some grapes bang some bread on the wall and have a happy new year and while you're at it for your happy new year follow <laughs> us on facebook instagram and twitter at supposedly pod <laughs> And if you're feeling especially generous for the new year and want to rate us or give us a comment or a five-star review, we'd really appreciate it. It really helps other people find us. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're just a baby podcast starting out. Um, help us grow. Yeah. And share your stories if you've got them. Maybe you have a custom for New Year's in your family that you'd like to share, and you can email us at supposedlypod at gmail.com. Maybe I'll even add it onto my New Year's list at this point. Who knows? <laughs> we'll see. All right. And join us next time on Supposedly in 2021! (gasps) Oh my god, you mean the next episode is going to be in 2021? Yeah! Yay! That's me banging the rubber head. That's the dog's hating me banging the (laughs) rubber head.